Welcome to the podcast is dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. We're joined by Cannondale and Trainer Road's Amber Pierce. Good morning. Hand up plus plus the Black Fizz Racing's Ivy Audrain. Almost it. got it. <laughs> Almost got it. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> Good to have you, Ivy. And our CEO, Nate coaster, Pearson. Huh? It is. Yeah. It is. And what's funny is that before each one of these, he practices and Ivy reminds him <laughs> and then he messes it up still. Look, she just did this. Some of us struggle when it comes to game time, you know, that, that's just what happens. It's a good thing. I do podcasts. Uh, we're going to talk to, or we're going to answer a whole lot of questions that you have today. We're going to talk about rider types. What happens when you don't fit into a rider type, uh, what you should pursue, what you shouldn't pursue, how you develop as a cyclist, the things you focus on. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to talk about overtraining. We're also going to talk about functional versus non-functional overreaching, which will be interesting mm -hmm. points of discussion and, and differentiation there, hopefully allowing us to recognize when we're doing too much and too little. And that's going to, I think, take some surprising twists for some of us, because it's not just going to talk about training volume in and of itself, which usually that conversation is purely focused on that. And then we'll also talk about plateauing, how each of us individually, when we have plateaued things that led to it, when we, uh, when we didn't plateau thereafter and what changed, how to avoid it, all those things. It's going to be a great episode. Um, Nate, Nate's never plateaued, so he might not be able to provide a whole lot of insight in that. Nate just, he, he's like stonks always up. So no don't plateau. know my <laughs> potential, <laughs> not always up <laughs> because I just used, uh, a new feature on, I haven't been training since Cape Epic and I used a new feature to, to, uh, detect where my FTP is. And it went down a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I think it's like 283 now, but, uh, yeah, I just, it's, broken, I want, right. That's yeah. That's what I said at the forum. It's going to talk about. Can we talk yeah. about that now, John? Let's do it. Big, let's just leave. Big, big, big yeah. deal. Yeah, let's absolutely. Let's do it. AI FTP detection. <clears throat> We've yes. talked about it loosely before on the podcast. Uh, the name is super descriptive. It uses AI to detect your FTP. Nate yeah. or Amber, who wants to talk first on this? Can I start Amber? Nate? And then I'll give you the yes. details. I get, sorry. You this may. Is, I have to. <laughs> I'm so excited. You're so excited. Um, <laughs> I am. Okay. So one, one quick thing, sorry, yeah. Nate, before you get into this, um, the other day, somebody on the forum said that uh, this podcast is turning into a morning talk show. There were a lot of people that just that disagreed. I want something to be clear really quick. When we talk about things in the beginning, we don't just talk about our day. I'm not like, Hey, Ivy, your hair looks great. Although I might actually say that we might talk about that on the podcast, but instead it's always discussions that are driven toward answering questions that we get from people. Like, uh, I don't ask Nate about his coffee instead I'll ask Nate, and this is just an example about how his training has been going. And I'll drive the discussion toward answering questions that we get that week. So if you feel like this discussion on AI FTP, uh, detection is a morning talk show thing, I welcome you in. First of all, it's fantastic. Water's great. And then also something to keep in mind is that this is going to answer questions that we get from athletes. That's the whole point. So with that said, Nate, let's dig into it. You're showing them behind the curtain. You mean, sorry, sometimes the things we say, like we have it all planned out <laughs> and it might Imagine seem that. like it's just off the cuff, but it's not weird. I wonder why we do yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what this is, is, uh, let me give you a little history about this. This is something like from day one, like back in 2010, dreaming about it is, can you get a machine to like, tell you how fast you are or to tell you what to do to be fast? And what we originally did is we had a ML engineer mini machine learning. Uh, we, the goal was to predict your FTP based on what training plan you did, what was on your calendar at different states looking ahead, because that's really cool. Is like, if you do that step one, it's motivating for athletes, right? You can say, Oh, as I train closer, there's, there'll be like a, a window here of what the range of FTP will be, FTP will be. And as I get closer, it'll, we'll know more and more and more until you get to the day and you'll actually know what your FTP is. That has a whole bunch of implications of like, well, then can we run Monte Carlo simulations and figure out like, uh, what would be the best actual training plan for you, right? This is like one step in that. So we're building that. And then I think in a meeting, we're like, well, why don't we just predict today? Because we're waiting, we're just did that thing where you step through it and then you get to know at the end what it is. And we're like, does it work if you just predict today? We're like, yeah, it does work. So we did some tests and we're like, wow, we can actually detect what your FTP is on a day. And then we thought, well, what if on the ramp test, you just get a choice of either let us detect your FTP or you do a ramp test. And, uh, that is what we have built. And Amber's team has launched this into early access yesterday. 
to go into early access, you have to go on the website. Actually, I'll let her explain that stuff in a second. I want to tell you a little bit more about how the feature was built. So what you do in machine learning is you, uh, first you, you do is you build what are called features, which are like summaries of data about an athlete and points. Cause you know, if you look at your history, you might go back 10 years with thousands of files. I mean, there could be like, there's billions and billions of points, right. For like every second and all that stuff. And how do you analyze that? Um, so what engineers do is they, they massage the data and, uh, do calculations on it. And then they, they train on a certain subset of data. They train a model with it, which means that's the uh, machine learning model. And then they apply it to another set of data. And so for us, we applied it to another set of data and we could go back in time, lucky for us, because we have so much history and run through it and see how accurate are these predictions. And then the engineers come back and they make it more accurate and more accurate. And they put in different inputs, right? So they put in more things to make the, how accurate our AI FTP detection is over and over and over again. So even right now, as we launch this, they're putting in more stuff uh, into it. And I think on the forum, I've said, uh, there's other things we can do on this technique of pulling the data from outside sources. We're not ready yet, but that's something. So uh, why this is really cool is, you know, you might say, well, other software detects my FTP. As, as far as I know, all of those, all of the software that does that looks at your power curve and needs some capacitive efforts. So it needs you to like uh, do an all out something or at different ranges. And some of them do really well if you, if they have that, right. And it's an algorithm. The difference between us is we will detect or predict in the future. And I just want to be clear, prediction's not out yet. We're, that's a thing that Amper's team's working on after we use some more stuff on uh, AI FTP detection. The thing that's cool is you can do all sweet spot work and we can detect a higher FTP. You can do all endurance work, all Z2. Because we know if you, like me off the couch, I do all Z2, I'm going to have a higher FTP. Other systems, models won't ever detect that. So it... It looks at both your inside trainer road workouts and your outside unstructured workouts that aren't trainer road. There's nothing you need to do inside of that. So you can, there's someone on the forum. Uh, he actually did hundred percent outside rides and we launched this and he said, that's exactly what I thought my FTP was going to be based on how it feels and threshold as an experienced athlete. Uh, that is pretty cool. So <laughs> like, I don't know, like I was so excited about it and I know some people will probably roll their eyes at it, but this is a big, big, big deal in my mind. Uh, I think the ML engineer worked on it for a year with other people mm -hmm. helping them to get the model. Is that right? So Amber, can you describe now the feature? Like how do we actually use it? Yeah. So, um, it's available to anybody who's a trainer road athlete. If you're a trainer road athlete, go to your account, account settings, click on early access in early access. You will see AI FTP detection, click on enable it's just a little radio button. And once it's enabled, when the ramp test is your next workout, Go to your career page. This won't show up on calendar right now, and it's only in the app. So it's not going to show up on web. You need to launch the app when, I'm sorry, when the ramp test is your next workout, go to your career page and you will see a new button. And that button is right next to the load ramp test button. And that new button says use AI or use FTP detection. So clicking on that button will reveal uh, your detected FTP. And at that point, you'll have the option to either accept it or dismiss it. So you're not locked into it. If you hit that button, um, you are still free to load the ramp test if you really, really want to, but that's how you can check out what your detected FTP is. If you do decide to accept that FTP, we will replace the ramp test with a workout for you and you can go on your merry way. So you don't have to do the ramp test. You can update your FTP and get a workout all in one, like just in a couple clicks. It's pretty sweet. Pretty amazing. So the turn on early access that's on the website under settings. And then you go to the, the app under career and right. you just have to have a exactly. ramp test scheduled that day. So Amber, this is right now it is, we want to get out as fast as possible with minimum mm -hmm. UI. And we have big plans for this. Do you oh, want to yes. talk about what the kind of the follow on steps so people can set expectations and how this isn't, this is just the first step of the UI portion of it. Yeah, this is, this is a very, very minimal version of this. So um, it's still super exciting to be able to see what your, your detected FTP is, but we have a couple more, we're going to have some really fast follow on So one is um, if you get an FTP increase, we'll be able to show your adjusted progression levels before you go ahead and accept that FTP. Um, so that'll be really cool. You can preview how those levels are going to change. I know that that was something that uh, some people in the forum have already been asking about. Right now we have a hard coded replacement workout, but very, very soon we're going to be able to give you a custom recommended workout. So based on your training plan, your progression levels, your new FTP, your goals, we will give a, give you a custom replacement workout instead of the hard coded one. Um, we will be bringing this into calendar 
And right now there's just two options to either load the, the ramp test or accept the new FTP in the future. Um, in a very near future, you'll be able to ignore. Uh, so you could skip the ramp test and ignore the new suggested FTP to just continue training, um, to increase your progression levels if you would prefer to do that. So we've got some really exciting stuff coming up in the pipeline. Um, that's all going to be pretty soon. And like Nate said, predicted FTP is on the roadmap a little further in the future. There's some really, really cool stuff we're going to be able to do with this. And I just want to say a lot of people in the forum have been, um, congratulating me and my team and my team has worked really hard on this, but I really want to reiterate that this was a huge effort that didn't just involve my team. This was a lot of work by the ML team, um, the support team, the marketing team, everybody has pitched in to make this happen. And so, uh, I just want to give a big shout out to team TR cause, uh, this was a huge effort and we're really, really proud of it. It's crazy. And then just even just pulling in the data over years, like the backend team, like <laughs> yeah. you don't realize yeah. how many steps there are and building the calendar so much work. and then just getting this data, because again, we have all this plan versus actual data that other people don't have that helps us do this, which is, uh, amazing too. Uh, one thing to know is that if you change your FTP, you cannot do this again for 14 days, you can keep peeking at it, but you can't keep changing it. So that's to know that right mm -hmm. now. And then, uh, uh, the dream of the future, this is the vision. This is a little bit ways out. Cause we have a couple things inside of this is that when you have plan builder, you have two options. One is the way today is I want to still have tests at this regular interval and I could still detect a AI FTP if I wanted to, or the other one is there's no testing and we will tell you when your FTP is higher. And also this is Amber's idea, which is so good. Depending on where you are in your phase, what your goals are and stuff, we will adjust we will change it at specific, um, where we think you are at the right point in your progression. So for instance, if you are a 40 K time trialist and you're in the 40 K TT plan and you're getting pretty close, like let's say you even have six weeks, we could even set you up to have the, to come into that plan with the correct time and zones. So that when you hit that last, those last workouts, you're doing those 50, 55 minute 40 K TT simulations. And we can work backwards in that. Um, what's that's what, what's going to happen with that is we would have to manipulate your FTP a little bit with levels so that we get you at the right time and zone. And that could be an ego boost or hurt for some people, depending on which way we go. Uh, but it is, that's just like the next fine grain control of evolution of it. That is so, so cool where we think about the details. So you don't have to, um, or you can trust that. And, uh, two, remember that this AI FTP detection works in tandem with adaptive training. So we get you your number and then we adjust your different, um, uh, zones to be correct for you. And those relationships to those zones, uh, will be different for, for different people. And that's why we have adaptive training. So this is one step inside of our whole system that then, you know, gets the feedback of every workout, gets your RPE and then constantly adjusts. <clears throat> it's not just, don't look at it just as, uh, only AFT detection. You gotta look at the whole system together. So anyways, yeah. super exciting. Yeah, John. Yeah, I want to share like a concern that I got on that very thing and how this answers that. Um, an athlete say, hey, I saw the FTP detection said that it was going to be 286, um, but I didn't want to accept that. So I took the ramp test and turns out that I was 288. So it was actually wrong. And I was like, well, let's think about that. First of all, two watts. Uh, first, of all, your power meter probably has fluctuation in, in reading even beyond two watts. Um, yeah. but number two, the other side of this too, is you have adaptive training to make any sort of adjustments thereafter. And there's a window and the more data you have, and the more inputs that we have, that window gets smaller and smaller. Or our confidence rises in terms of estimating what your FTP is, but two Watts, that sort of a thing for most people that are experienced in training, you know, that two Watts isn't going to make a massive difference, particularly, and especially when you have adaptive training, adjusting your workouts thereafter. So, uh, if, if you feel like if you're, if you're trying to let's really split hairs and see where it's at, uh, that's just some, a few things to keep in mind. Um, it's a really important part. Yeah. I want to like... go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Amber. I was just going to have a couple notes on best practices to get, you know, if you're going to use it right oh. now to get the best experience, but Nate, Let you go ahead and then. I can jump yeah. in after. Yeah. So if we could test everyone's blood and we had a gas exchange and everyone wanted to do capacitive efforts and like, just really hurt. Uh, like the things that you see in like those old documentaries of people, mm -hmm. uh, we probably have a different system. Everyone had the, those $10,000 machines. That'd be great. But what, what's really cool about this is let's say you have two different methods of predicting FTP. One says 230, one says 220. Uh, 
and let's say the 230 overestimated you so that you're really more like 220. What adaptive training will do is we'll either at the 230, it would put you at 95% repeats at threshold to put you at 220, or if you're at 220, it would keep you at 220. So like it's that number can be further influenced and uh, adjusted with your progression levels with adaptive training. So that's two, when someone says two watts, one, two watts isn't that big of a deal, but even some bigger stuff, uh, it can adjust. And that's why adaptive training was really cool with if someone doesn't have a totally capacitive effort, like you can, on a ramp test, you can still go forward and like, we'll, we'll get you just right. But mm -hmm. now you don't even have to do that. Don't, you know, we should do a live ramp test where we just <laughs> click the button and we go, oh, okay. And that's it. And we <laughs> that just was actually on. <laughs> one of the marketing ideas that we have was to schedule a live ramp test and have us all kitted up and ready to go. And then we just did a screen share and we just <laughs> use FTP button. detection done. <laughs> yeah. And then it goes yeah. into beers with Chad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Our work is done. How are you not in the meeting? This is exactly what I know, we said. I'm a marketing Amazing. genius. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Here we are. Um, <laughs> Why, one thing what's the problem with beers with Chad? Is it just that <laughs> Nate won't do it anymore? We just well, I was, person? I was pretty afraid that the uh, company would go down in flames. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> did you not? It's just that Nate's them? still hung over. <laughs> There's a reason no. that those were not on YouTube. There's a reason that those were posted as Instagram stories and then thusly disappeared. <clears throat> so. I kind of feel like, uh, yeah, I don't, never mind. I, I'll, I kind of want to do it though. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, yeah, that, that, everyone that, wants it. I have alcohol here. I can, <laughs> Amber. <laughs> <laughs> you know that Mario thing where he's like, jumping through all the levels and he's trying to miss those like spinning sticks. I don't know if you've no. seen that. That's what I felt like during beers of the chat. I was like, we narrowly escaped. We narrowly escaped just over and over. And over. Like for those who don't know, I drink so much, like stress. too much. I, I, I don't even like to drink anymore. Like one drink not makes me feel horrible right now, but that night I thought I had tanked the company. Like I went to bed so scared. I was like, then message you, John. I was oh, yeah. just like, lots of messages. This is over. The company is gone. I didn't remember everything I said. It was, it was, horrible. we've learned, we've learned. Yeah. Um, one thing, maybe we have, I don't know. I'm Nate so just, <laughs> um, one thing, one thing I want to say before you go into this, uh, Amber, uh, this isn't, so this is individually, uh, adjusted and Amber, you'll probably have a better way of saying this, but, um, so Nate and I could theoretically in this really weird world, Nate and I could put out the same amount of power during every moment of our training for the past two weeks or something, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we're still going to get the same FTP detected because this right. system looks at me as an athlete over time, all of my FTP over time and the history of that, my training, it's, it's, it's very individualized. So I've seen some people go, well, you must be just using ramp test logic and finding like the fastest one or the highest one minute and then reducing. And that's absolutely not nope. the case. It's entirely different. And then on top of that, it's also not using some sort of um, basic non-personalized formula that then is applied to everybody the same. It's very, it's, it's very different, right, Amber? Exactly. So number one, this is not using any single static equation. Um, so not not that this is a, this is a pretty dynamic model. Um, number two, the model looks at your entire FTP history, um, several months of your training history. It weights your more recent training more heavily, wait, but it contextualizes wait, wait, wait. that. We, no, <laughs> it's like no secret sauce. <laughs> let, let me describe the, I, I don't know where you're going, but I, Nate's scared. I, yeah. I'm just, this is a beers with Chad moment. Uh, <laughs> it is. So let's just say it, it does look at your whole history and John and I could be, have the exact same workouts for six months, different at the same Watts, different predicted FTPs or detected FTPs yes. for each of us. There's cause the whole thing with ML is like the, uh, so that the, the ML like thing that that learns is something off the shelf, right? Like Google, Apple, like these AI researchers do it. The whole key of it is what data do you put into it? How do you, how do you categorize that data? And Amber just said a few things, but I didn't know where she was going. And I would hate it to have it like, to be like what John does on other things. in their, in their like notebooks. And then they just got really frustrated because you interrupted me. Exactly. So <laughs> sorry for interrupting snaps. you, Amber. And I don't know where you were going that. And I'm sure you wouldn't have just said anything too deep, but, uh, in general, it's, right. it's fancy. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's, fancy. it's fancy. Yeah, no. So, so the point is that we're not just looking at a single effort. And the nice thing about this is if you do have an outlier effort, it's very unlikely that that one outlier effort is going to sway the model too much and give you an overinflated or underinflated FTP. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a really nice thing. We're taking into account a whole lot of data and it's your individual data. So again, this is, this is a highly customized, highly personalized uh, detection model tool, whatever you want to call it. We've gone through a few name iterations. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I got on this hammer, it's related to that is mm -hmm. uh, I'm really enjoying my training right now, but now I'm worried because next week I have a crit and during that crit, it's always super hard. And I'm worried that it's that one effort is going to give me some sort of inflated FTP because it's an NP buster sort of race, right? Where it's like, really mm -hmm. hard and I get a really high MP, but that is, that's not really a justified fear, right? It's not going to get completely distracted by just one effort. Exactly. Right. It will, it will take that effort into consideration. That's mm -hmm. the important thing. Cause it's important to know that you're capable of doing that, but it's not going to be something that overly sways, sways the model. You're not going to go to two from 200 to 350. <laughs> You know, yeah. but I mean, yeah. the goal is to get us to get you to be doing productive workouts after the RAM test. So you're at the right level to exactly. get faster. Right. And, uh, because this is a train, because this isn't like an algorithm, it's a trained model. It has looked in the past. And if, if in general, looking at everybody, uh, if it has detected, if you did that one workout, then you would be able to do these, these harder workouts, right. In the future, like you did this one race and then everyone's fitness jumped, it would have learned that and figured it out, but it has learned that that is not the case, right? Mm -hmm. There might be some other cases, or maybe it's learned that in this many ones in a row, if you do this, then it's the case that it does go up. But that it's the cool thing about this stuff is the way that we wrote it, we have a little bit of visibility about what's happening, but we don't really know what's happening, which is cool and scary. Uh, all we know is we can test to see how accurate it is. And it, what we want feedback from Amber on this part is if you, if you choose the AI FTP detection, you accept it, you, you know, the levels adjust and you start doing productive workouts and you think they are either too hard or too easy. Uh, you know, we'll get that information with the RP survey, but please email us, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the, the way to do it? Email us at support at trainer.com. Is that how you want the feedback? Also, um, you can do that. And you can also on the early access page, there's a little link that says leave feedback. You can leave feedback there too. Both oh, channels will work. That. They will come back to us. Yeah. Either way is good. Save our support team and use the feedback one. So it goes directly to Amber team, the ML team. <laughs> there we go. There's yeah. an, um, another question, Amber, do I need heart rate, like a heart rate monitor for this? Right. Someone just asked this in the chat and the answer is no. Um, so part of the reason for that is number one, our model does really well, just looking at power, but also heart rate is, while it is valuable uh, to know, there are a lot of factors that can affect heart rate that aren't necessarily related to your current fitness. So for example, ambient temperature, hydration status, caffeine intake, elevation, sleep, <laughs> these are all things that can strongly influence your heart rate. Um, and so we're not taking that into account right now. If we are. our data shows we are not. <laughs> yeah. I Rides without power meters, look at heart rate. And there's a whole thing. There's a whole new machine learning model around that. So I'll just say in where your heart rate model. Uh, mm. Yeah. That, Learn something new every it's, day. <laughs> it's, it's not necessary though for the model to work. It's not necessary. So if, if you did all your rides without a heart rate monitor, you're fine. But if you uh, right. start, if you do a lot of rides without a power meter, we're your heart rate monitor. That will then impact it. Yeah. There's uh, Unless it's changed recently, but that's. Who what, knows? Nate's <laughs> what Nate's alluding to down the road, exciting stuff. Uh, yes. Very exciting stuff. So yeah. Just, I think, I think going forward forever, just wear your heart rate monitor on every workout. I know before, like years ago, I was like, I don't wear it because blah, 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 but, uh, you're not going to be screwed by not doing it, but I would mm -hmm. start doing it now. Yeah. Uh, another, but it's not question. necessary. We'll make that. Yeah, it's not necessary. So you, don't like have, I, you don't have to run out and buy a heart rate monitor. Use this feature. Sure. Not at all. Not at all. Yep. Okay. Uh, another question on this one. Uh, you already mentioned this, but I want to be explicit. If I have been doing outdoor rides, it is taking those outdoor rides into account into the, into this, right? Amber. So yes. some athletes are like, well, I haven't done a trainer road workout in a long time. And I want to sign back up with trainer road. And I want to do that. The more structured work you do, the better it gets. Is it fair to say Amber, but at the yes. same time, it's still looking at your outdoor rides. It does. The model does take into account even your unstructured rides, whether yeah. those are indoors or outdoors. Yeah. And this also 
evidence because some people are like, well, when is adaptive training going to look at my outdoor rides? We've been working on this and we continue to work on this and we're making a lot of progress on that all the time. But this is good evidence of the fact that like, hey, it's like not like it's smoke and mirrors here. We truly are. And this is an example of a feature that is already using what we've worked on for adaptive training to take into consideration the outdoor rides. It's doing it. So yeah, this does can take into consideration. And I think what they're asking for is when will outdoor rides impact my progression levels? Yeah. And someone in here, Patrick has a question of like, Hey, you know, I can put out more power outside, uh, versus inside. So won't that mess things up? Got you covered, Patrick. We understand yep. that. And, uh, we, we do stuff for that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We do stuff. <laughs> yeah. That, that's uh, a very I secret sauce thing though, too. Cause it's not a easy thing that we've done. So that's, but we understand that and we, uh, are aware of it. And that has been, we work on it. Another question to ask Amber, this is kind of like a theoretical question, I guess. Yes. Uh, should I consider a test result to be better than the AI FTP detected result from this? Cause that's like a, people are kind of like, well, I have a gold standard of a test that I've done over here versus AI FTP detection. What are your thoughts on that? So testing is really stressful for a lot of people. Um, and what this does is it offers you a much lower, like it, it can take the stress out of the equation, hit a button, and then you can do a productive workout. So um, one thing that I've heard people say is like, well, you're just making this too easy and it's not meant to be easy is you got to do hard stuff in your training. And I agree with that, but most FTP protocols, even though they require an all out effort, um, they're pretty short. And they're not necessarily going to be focused and um, productive in terms of your overall goals. So what this offers you is the opportunity to update your FTP and do a workout that's going to be more productive and more focused toward um, elevating your fitness. I would I would love to rant on this, but I will contain myself and I will perform. I, I will behave as a gentleman here, but. Uh, we get plenty of people. In fact, I got a DM the other day saying like, you're just making people soft, multiple DMS, uh, with this feature. And, I, <laughs> and I want to reinforce this, uh, this is, this is, this, this matters deeply to me. Harder training is not better. Say it with me. Like harder training is training not, not better. better. It's, it's getting the right training is what's better. So yeah. Uh, just because, and, and trust me, if you're training and doing it right, you will have plenty of workouts that will stress you. You don't have to worry about that. You'll also have races or events or big days in the saddle or whatever else that motivates you that stress you. So like, you'll still have those. Uh, it's if you don't constantly chase every workout, smashing me into the ground, that is not a sustainable trajectory. We've said this like a broken record too on our podcast, but the data shows that the athletes with the most training consistency. And what I mean by that is consistent amount of training over a period of time and looking at that at short to long time scales, the most consistent athletes are the ones that get faster. And if you're trying to just say, I need training to be hard every day and break yourself into the ground every single day, that's not sustainable. You won't be able to do it, especially if you're doing something like holding on to that, that very exciting 300 plus watt FTP that you want to hold on to because it really pads the ego, but then it makes your training compromised. Adaptive training will do as best as it can with that and it'll make adjustments. But if it's way off the mark and you're holding on to something that's way high, you'll never get to that long time in zone that you need to work on with threshold or sweet spot or anything else. So this can really help. I know a lot of people, we looked at the data, a shocking amount of athletes don't take. John for everyone else. The amount of athletes. What's that? Oh, you, he just froze up a little up. bit. Am I, I here? Am I back? He's back. Stay I thought you said a, a bunch of people don't test. Yes. Yeah. Huge amounts of them. And, and it's a shocking amount. Actually, when we looked at the data for how many athletes skip tests and I understand why you shouldn't feel bad for wanting to skip a test. That's okay. Like, uh, I, for some reason, it's almost like I did a ramp test in front of tens of thousands of people multiple times on the internet, but I can't seem to get a good result with a ramp test. When I mean good, I mean, one that gives me productive training, not one that gives me vanity metrics, but one that gives me productive training. That's just, I, I'm broken in the head with it. So I understand you might not have a good relationship with testing. And this is a great way to get well calibrated training. Cause like Nate said, the point isn't to get the highest number possible. Otherwise trust us. 
we know how to give you a 300 watt plus watt FTP and just make it say 300, right? Like we could do that, but that's not how you get the most trained or the best training. Our goal is to get you well calibrated training. That's the whole point. And that, that split between people who don't test is, um, there's people who just don't like to test or they're new and it's hard. They don't understand it. The other side too, is the, the people who think they know their FTP and the, the biggest are the pros, mm -hmm. man. We we've seen pros come our system almost ever, <laughs> not you Amber of course not you but uh, and not Ivy they, yeah <laughs> they put in these crazy FTPs and they get through like you know four minutes at threshold and then give up uh, yeah <laughs> it, uh, I don't know if this is like yeah. a coach just telling them stuff or they had a hot power meter somewhere and it makes you feel good but uh, I'm that's total speculation but in general I'm very curious to see what would happen uh, in the future if we just on onboarding you pull your data in and we tell you and if you do something different. We could see afterwards versus us versus what you actually type in, uh, what happened. Another cool thing is after time off. So Amber, you have taken time off and you had a bodybuilding program. Mm -hmm. You made a little bit cute baby. <laughs> yes. uh, and then you use this to tell her, tell people how you use this. Cause this is another way that people might not know about. Yeah. So I actually use this to detect, um, an FTP decrease. So I had taken a lot of time off, um, toward the end of my pregnancy and postpartum, and I was ready to get back on the bike. But let me tell you, uh, postpartum, not excited to do a ramp test, like really, really didn't want to do a ramp test. So I guessed at my FTP and I did a 30 minute sweet spot workout, which I thought would be a no, no problem. Um, totally failed it completely struggled, completely got my guess wrong. So then I used the AI FTP detection and it dialed me in and it was perfect. Like I, I was able to do a workout immediately productive workout. Um, and I will tell you my drop was close to 70 Watts. Like it was a big, big drop and that was a lot of time off. Um, but the model nailed it. It really did. So, and it made it so much less stressful for me. I didn't have to get in and do a capacitive effort when I'm just really <laughs> building back pretty much from square one. <laughs> The, the way that we could do that first is, uh, that can be a daunting thing to get back into training is to know that your first workout has to be a ramp test. And you're like, well, I haven't trained yet trained recently. So how could I do this? Right. And it's stressful. I I'm in this case right now. I don't want to do my, uh, I still have not the gusto that I had right before Cape Epic, but what's cool is I just looked, we have almost 130 million rides in our system. <laughs> so this is how we figure out is we have enough cases where somebody of similar stats to Amber has taken this much time off. And then they, uh, they came back on the bike and we can do all this math, crazy stuff to figure out where in the point, like interpolate where her FTP is going to be. And all this stuff has been learned about, uh, on the back end. So that's another cool thing that I'm really send it to me in the form of another model can do this, but can you take off four months, have a 70 watt decrease and nail someone's FTP without any like data? like any yeah. new data. That's pretty crazy to me. That's another question with this is, uh, will AI FTP detection work if I've never used trainer road? Um, and Amber that if you go in and you use ride sync, right? So you've connected your ride history, whether it's through Strava or Garmin connect or anything like that. And you have those rides, it'll still work for you. It'll get better. As we've said, as you give it more data and more structured data, for sure, it'll get better, but it still will work for you. Right. It works best if you have um, at least 12 trainer road workouts, but we can look at your data if you don't have trainer road workouts, but if you bring those, if you bring that data in. So best practices, um, this will work best if you have a lot of structured training, it will work best if you have trainer road workouts. And I'm not just saying that as a marketing cell, that's just a fact of how, mm -hmm. because this is part of how we train the model. Um, it will work best if your age is accurate. So we have a surprising number of athletes who have birthdays in the future. It's amazing. Time travelers. Um, <laughs> why didn't y'all warn us about COVID? <laughs> yeah. No. Could have, could have, yeah. Information would have been helpful yesterday. Yeah. Right. Uh, so anyway, make sure that information is accurate. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it should, it should be able mm -hmm. to work. I, I want to say that a different way that Amber just said right now, I believe we have a gate in that you have to have 12 train road workouts before you can do this. And mm, that yes. is because we need to validate parts of this model, even more with more people. And then mm -hmm. if we can, and we validate it, we'll step it back so that you don't have to have any trainer road workouts. Cause just as we've seen in the forum, there are some people with no trainer road workouts It's working great, but, mm -hmm. uh, early access, we want to be, uh, 
more cautious than not cautious. And that's also why we don't let people change all the time. Uh, and we do that, but the goal mm -hmm. and what we really want to do is because it doesn't, uh, I don't think Amber, we actually do need any trainer workouts. And I, I, I know we're just being cautious and the product manager for there wants to do that. We'll see what, what happens in the future with that, because that's exciting. That's the, what John just said is what we want is that you just sync your stuff. You wait for your account to sync, and then we start get your training. Uh, yeah. You don't have to do any ramp tests. One, uh, an, another point on this that you just made Amber, I want to bring this in, uh, athletes that, uh, so masters age athletes, um, we've talked, we talked for, uh, geez, uh, this is a few years ago. Now we talked about building masters plans and we didn't do that because we also had this going and we thought this is a much better way to address this issue of athletes being able to train as they need and adjusting training for them. So adaptive training. And this is another fantastic example with AI FTP detection, making it so that it works for athletes of any age and it will adjust for you. Um, it's going to, like Amber said, it's going to look at you in terms of like a profile, but it also looks at you in terms of an individual. So then it can really make sure that it's making the necessary adjustments that get you the right training. So masters athletes rejoice, uh, adaptive training is going to constantly be making your training better for you. Uh, that's the whole point of it. And that goes for young athletes to old across the board. So pretty and there's cool still stuff. a more things we could do for masters, just, you know, but this was the biggest impact that we could have at first. And no matter what, we probably want to do this first. Oh yeah, for sure. Yep. It all builds in step, right? Let's just talk about else? product for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else we should cover on this? Hopefully this is answering a lot of questions for a lot of athletes about FTP testing, about all that stuff. And also I want to cover one thing really quick with FTP testing. Uh, isn't it silly that we think that like, in one moment on one day, we're going to get a perfect, very accurate representation of your potential as an athlete at that moment. Uh, and we're going to ignore the fact that there are so many variables that could be affecting you in your life. Like if you think about it, testing is kind of a weird way to think that we're going to get an accurate picture of who you are as an athlete. We should be looking at much more than just like one effort from one exact moment in time. And that's what this is really doing. Nate, it looks like you want to say something. Yeah. I mean, it's just the that's the only option before, right? Like mm -hmm. there, there was that you could look at workouts over time and stuff, but that takes a higher level of knowledge and mm -hmm. a coach could do it where it looks at every single workout and talks to you about it, which is kind of what we're doing now, but it does seem silly, but it also, I didn't know there wasn't a better way. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, really yeah. experienced athletes that are uh, that are fair and objective, they might be able to say, I feel like it's here because of just years upon years of structured training. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but even the best athlete can get fooled by their own perception on that at different times. And, you know, <laughs> Amber's raising her head. Yeah. Uh, Amber has a lot of experience, uh, much more than we do. So, uh, it's, it's a really good thing to keep in mind is that this isn't just putting all the pressure on one specific moment. And you need to get absolutely everything out of yourself and it needs to be a perfect representation of your potential. There's no need for that sort of stress. This, it takes a totally different approach. It looks at you as a person and as an athlete on a much broader scale. So it's cool stuff. You and Ivy. <laughs> Good. She's, Wait, I'm just she, happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she muted herself. That's how much she was like, oh, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, Ivy's Ivy's just as up to speed on all this stuff because Ivy's in the forum answering your questions and doing everything else. Amber's Amber and Nate have been in there yesterday on this specific topic, but um, yeah. So Ivy Ivy knows all that stuff, uh, and she's going to be pitching in on it too. The last thing, if you do yeah. want to talk about this or discuss it with us, Amber and I are in the forums, and Ivy. It is, there's a introducing IFTP detection thread in the trainer.com slash forum. Uh, by the way, that forum is big. We, it's like 3 million page views a month. Um, yeah. I think big. that's big in cycling. It seems like yeah. a lot. I think a lot it's of the biggest know. cycling forum as I, as I, I believe, uh, just by the information I believe. that I can access. So yeah, by how often people post, cause I look at all the other ones cause I have a big ego. And yeah. I can see that <laughs> no, I'm doing market competitor research, right? Um, yeah, you can it. see that, uh, mm -hmm. we get a lot of posts and that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it I is. Like, yeah, if research. we don't have more posts, I just have a bad day and like <laughs> <laughs> Nate's over there creating burner accounts and making more posts. Gotta, yeah. Gotta just to fill my ego. <laughs> yeah. There's like, the audience like that's yeah, like, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys uh, don't even know. Ivy, Ivy's so clever and witty. Sometimes I wonder if if like uh, when I see clever and witty responses and I don't recognize the username, I'm like, maybe that's <laughs> Ivy. Maybe she's created a burner account. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Oh, say the uh, things that I want to say to athletes that I can't really always say. Yeah. Don, yeah. I want to say two more things. One is we saw someone on our forum private messaging people pretending to help them and then sending them to like competitors and stuff. So if you see this happening, Whoa. please send it to us. I know. I, I looked at somebody sent it to us and they did it to like 45 wow. people. They're like, oh, blah, blah. they act like their friend. And then they like slowly be like, well, I use this and you should go use this. And like, uh, it's, it's obviously someone from, I think from that company or really good friends with that company, or they're just like the best evangelist ever. But <laughs> I don't, yeah. personally, I don't think they were really trying to help people. I were trying things to make sales. So if that is happening, please uh, let us know. We banned that person, but who knows? They come back many different ways. Like Ivy said, the burner counts. The next thing is that we did another <laughs> small release which is progression levels hover state. So on the website, mm -hmm. if you hover oh, yeah. over progression level, what we'll do now is it will tell you what the, what the change was that changed that progression level. If it's training and activity, what the workout was, all of that. And we did that because uh, we had questions around people of like, well, why did this change, right? They sent in the support. So now you know, this helps you understand your progression levels better and what changes things. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. If you... and by the way, we have more planned on that down the road. We constant improvement is one of the principles so that we talk about here. And we want <laughs> to make it so that you feel like you have a really good fix and all the context necessary on why your levels are changing. So expect that to constantly improve. Um, uh, if you appreciate all of this awesome product development, all of this great stuff that the whole team and the people that are here at trainer road that aren't inside these four squares or aren't inside your ears right now, that's creepy sounding, but all the people at Trainer Road that have worked on these things. If you appreciate that, there are a couple of things that I would love for you to do. Number one, you could rate this podcast, rate it five stars, or let us know what we need to do to get a five-star review from you. And we'll do it and we'll get there. And then the other thing is you can rate the Trainer Road app and you can share it with people. Uh, in that process of when you do a review, you can also share the app and share the podcast with other people. That would be hugely helpful. So if you appreciate all of this, that would be a great way to show appreciation. We're excited to make it all of you faster. Let's get into Craig's question. He says, my question is regarding mood and mental health. When I hit a point in my training block where I'm overreaching, and those are these are his words, it's important to point out, where I'm overreaching, my overall mental health spirals, and I become very irritable and potentially depressed. I eat when I'm hungry and nap when I feel I need it. I follow a mid, and so those are two, those are interesting things I think that we'll come back to, that statement there. I follow a mid volume sweet spot base plan and I strength train three times per week. So that's actually quite a lot of work, especially when you talk yeah. about an, an like that's a lot of work for a cyclist, but that's a lot of work, a huge amount of work for an average individual. Um, even like mm -hmm. an average active fit going or like gym going individual. That's a lot. Craig says, are there strategies to avoid this change in mood or am I just weak? Ah, Craig, I want to give you oh. a hug. First of all, uh, you're not just weak. Um, that's like uh, but boy, the whole thing of like, you just need to train hard. You need to, you know, smash yourself into the ground with every workout. That's the sort of mentality. And that's what it creates is that we then think that we're weak because we're training, we're following a mid volume plan and we're strength training three times a week. Like we should not feel that at all. So that's the first thing internet hug to you, Craig. Uh, you're not soft. Um, can we talk, let's break this down like step-by-step step. functional versus non-functional overreaching. Let's talk about that first, because with training, you want to overreach at a measured amount, right? Like you want to get to the point where you are working, you're stressing your abilities, but then giving yourself time to recover. Um, Ivy, can you talk a little bit about like non-functional overreaching or what that would be in terms of what it's, what it's felt like for you in the past? If you've gone through that, I assume you have. Uh, can you define non-functional overreaching <laughs> for myself and also our listeners? <laughs> Amber, how about you define it for us? And then we can go after that. And Ivy, you can share your experience on it. So, um, I'll give you guys a very non-scientific definition of this, but functional overreaching is where, like we've said before, you want to stress your system in order to elicit adaptations. You have to stress your system enough that your system has something to adapt to. So if you're only stressing your system to the point where it's already adapted to that level of stress, you're not going to get additional adaptations. You have to stress beyond what your body has already adapted to. So that means that there's usually a little short period of time where you are functionally overreaching. So you're stressing your system a little bit more than what it's actually capable of right now. And then when you rest, your body will recover and super compensate to a point where now 
it's adapted to a higher level of fitness. And then you need to stress it a little bit beyond that recover and so on. And this is what we call progressive overload. Um, so it's an incremental stressing of your system, allowing your system to recover enough that it can compensate adapt and move on. So that's the real key here is making sure that you're allowing enough recovery for your body to make those adaptations. When you get into non-functional overreaching is where you are putting too much stress and not enough recovery. So your body can't adapt to the training stress that you're putting onto it. And now you've gone from functional overreaching into non-functional overreaching, which means that you're piling on stress in a way that's not productive to progressing your fitness. And that's, and (laughs) Ivy, have you experienced that before on the non-functional overreaching side as a pro athlete racing around the world? Yeah, for sure. Um, And I think the thing that sticks out to me about what Craig said, that they eat when they're hungry and nap when they feel like it uh, and feel irritable and depressed in their mental health spirals. I feel like this is something that I experienced when I just wasn't nourishing myself in the way that I needed for my training volume and getting enough rest. And that rule of eat when you're hungry, that's not something that we consider sufficient on the bike. And it's definitely not sufficient off the bike either, especially when you're training a lot. And Craig does so much between their strength training. And I assume they have a life and a job and things to do otherwise. And, you know, worrying about the question itself was about mood and mental health, right? apart from their Mm -hmm. training. And I know that I definitely conflated depression with that fatigue and need for more food and rest. And there are times when like this off season in particular, when I didn't feel like skiing and didn't really feel like doing weight training and didn't feel like doing anything. And there are times when you definitely have, um, you know, clinical depression, And then when you start training and you see all those things, you know, (laughs) um, but you see all those things, you know, the irritability, irritability and, and being really tired, needing a lot of naps. When you see it in training, I complete the two and be like, oh my God, I'm still depressed. Like, um, and it takes having people in your circle, healthcare providers, counselors, other athletes that, that know what this is to help. That helps me identify, whoop, you're eating like half as much as you should, you're not sleeping enough. Um, you're, and, and sure enough, as soon as I started eating more and taking care of myself a little bit better, um, I used to take like an hour and a half nap, like every day. And I did not need it. And I thought I was depressed and I just needed to eat more. (laughs) That's that's a great point. Like it's hard. We aren't, we aren't perfect at being able to nail down the reasons behind everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Amber. Oh, I was just going to say, I I totally, I want to second something that Ivy said there, which is, um, sometimes when you're in heavy training and heavy training is relative, right? So it doesn't matter what volume plan you're on. If you are feeling that training stress, it could be heavy training for you. Um, sometimes those body signals don't come across the way that they normally do when you're not in heavy training. And I can give an example. Um, every time I ever, my whole career, every time I raced a heavy stage race, multi-day stage race, they were always really, really high stress. Cause we're stacking on that training stress day in and day out. And it gets to a point where it's not physically possible to eat enough to really keep up on those calories and make sure that you have an energy balance. And I will tell you, even though I'm in a massive energy deficit in the middle of one of those stage races, my appetite is gone and it actually becomes really stressful to eat enough or try to eat enough. Cause you know, you can't actually eat enough to, to make up for what you're burning every day. Um, it gets really stressful. And if I were just going based on hunger cues, I would not be eating anywhere near enough to fuel my body through an effort like that. Uh, so you really, when you get into heavy training, you really have to shift your mindset and be really mindful and proactive about fueling your efforts and making sure not just that you're fueling on the bike, that's super important, but as we've said before, you need to make sure that you're fueling throughout the day as well. So that your, your net energy balance is remaining positive. Um, it's just, it's, it's really, really important And the, the heavier the training is for you, the more important this becomes, because that's where, as you get into that functional overreaching, 
you are really kind of walking a razor's edge between a functional overreaching and non-functional overreaching and fueling yourself and getting enough rest are two of the things that can help prevent you from going into non-functional overreaching. Greg, I feel you. This is my entire training career of my like <laughs> eyes are too big for my stomach. I mean, I just keep boo, 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 boo until, uh, plug adaptive training has helped me on this of not going too hard on workouts, but this is what like the, the weight training that is not to be overlooked, especially if you're doing heavy days that are like the, the neuromuscular days. So the one, two, three, even up to five reps that are really hard. Man, I do those. And I am like, I will, now that I'm just weight training, I have nothing else in my life. I will do that. Not even that much volume, but the stress of that, there's this, um, mental fatigue that is, uh, uh, I've got the system. Amber probably knows, but it will, you will be tired the next day for almost no reason. And it's like a mental fatigue and not a physiological fatigue. And then I've done this before where I've done that and then try to go into a cycling workout and your art, your motivation is so low going into that when you're when your brain is fatigued like that. And then the RPE goes up so much. And then your uh, the RPE goes up too, if you're not eating enough, you eat, eat enough carbs or your protein is too low. And then that then makes that workout hard and you're using all this mental energy. And then the next workout is hard and it, you just go down this spiral where it just keeps getting harder and harder and harder. So Craig, what I would do is uh, on the weight training, I've had luck with this where instead of going, well, it depends on what your goals are. If you're going for strength, you're going to need those low reps, but that is, you can still get strong without doing that. And you can still get strong on higher reps. If you're going for just overall fitness, what I'm going to suggest is going to work just fine. And if you're going to be like, you know, I want bigger size muscles, you can actually go lower reps or higher reps. It's, uh, you know, you can go as high as I'm going to say. And what I've had really good luck with is going in that 12 to 15 range for, um, for rep range for working out. And that doesn't put as much mental, like the, uh, neuromuscular stress. I think that's, I might be using these wrong, uh, Amber jump in if I'm saying the wrong word or someone correct me later. Uh, it is much better to do those higher rep things. And I recover a lot better. You get some muscular endurance, which is going to help you on the bike too. Cause you know, that's, uh, that's a big part is, uh, not being tired on the bike. And then for muscle size, like it's very similar. Uh, at 15 reps as it is at, at like six reps, uh, which, which is crazy Two, make sure you're getting the, the protein. Uh, I mean, sorry, the protein, which I think you guys covered last week. I'm guessing you said two grams, 1.8 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight, something like that. I don't, I didn't listen to it, but yeah, everyone's saying yes. So In that they range. Can't hear you. Yeah. In yeah. that range. Yep. Um, and then, uh, I would drop the easy days on the mid volume. So that's the next step. So change your strength training a bit. Drop those easy days. Like they're not going to be really pushing you forward that much, especially if it's pushing you into overreaching so that on those days you can rest and chill and you can eat some food and you can kind of catch up on your calories. The next thing is use our, uh, workout alternatives. And on those, on like the harder days, especially that Saturday, instead of being progressive, make it achievable. Like don't progress on that Saturday. That's the longer workout habits, keep, keep it at the same level. So if you're at 4.5, just keep doing 4.5s or maybe if you feel bad, go to a 4.0, this is going to put you ahead long-term. It's going to seem like it won't, but it will let your Tuesday after you have um, some time off, go ahead, push forward. And especially that Sunday too, that's another one where you could drop it down. So have the weekend with a little bit more volume. You're still going to cycle. And just because you're down like one level, it's still going to be, you're still going to actually get faster but make it a little bit easier for you based on what the volume you have. You're not going to be able to, you've proven to yourself that you can't, uh, that this pushes you too much to over. So this is when you want to step back. And again, every, everyone has this point, everybody does. And we should not be ashamed at where this point is in our lives. Some people it's going to be two workouts a week. It just is because of lifestyle and everything. Other people like Amber, she was doing what, almost 40 hours swimming. They're crazy. Uh, but her whole life was arranged around that. And she probably was overreaching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 100%. So I just want to say that everyone's going to hit this, no matter what the training plan is. And you got to be aware and step back. And if you do step back, you're going to be faster. Your whole life's better. You're going to be more motivated. You're going to have more fun cycling. You're going to look better. It's, but it's really hard to do. I fall in this trap 
over and over and over again. Uh, so <sighs> I'm, that's why I'm saying it. Mm. Yeah. I think it's worth just jumping in and, um, talking about one way of like, how, how do you tell if you're functionally overreaching or non-functionally overreaching? Like what are the differences there? And I think a really key differentiator there is if you do take some time off and you make some of these adjustments, like Nate, Nate is describing and you bounce back and you start feeling better pretty soon. That's good. That's, you know, that probably, you know, if the functional reaching of these symptoms that you're describing last, maybe a week, and it happens to be the week before your rest week, and then you have your rest week, and then you feel good again, that might be functional overreaching. Um, but if this is something where you take some rest, you, you dial back the training and you're not experiencing, uh, a decrease in these symptoms, then mm. you might be functional. You might be overreaching and overreaching if it gets too bad, it can literally take yeah. years, non-functional yet, yeah. non-functional of reaching. If you let it go too far, it can take years to recover mm -hmm. from this. And I, I definitely have experienced that myself. It can take months. So it's really good to be proactive about tuning in. When is your mood changing? And mood is a really, really good barometer for this. If you're, if you really, like you said, feeling grumpy and irritable, um, your mood is really down. That is a good guidepost that something's up. And maybe take a look at your training plan, see if you have some rest coming up, if not build more in, see how you feel. Um, and that's on the physical side of things, but to go back to what I, Ivy was saying, and Nate touched on this too, um, it might not just be physical. There might be, um, an underlying mental health thing going on too. So really experiment with this and be hyper aware and honest with yourself about how you're feeling. Uh, the two will definitely, the, the two, like your, your training and your mental health will definitely, um, influence each other. So it might be really hard to tease them out exactly, but it's worth looking into getting some extra support. If you feel like that would help. Mm -hmm. Ivy, did you, uh, I couldn't tell if, uh, you wanted to jump in and say something. Oh, Amber was saying that it could take years or months to recover that. And I was just going to ad lib. If you don't quit bike racing first or riding yeah. first, like, yeah, yeah, it can push you yeah. that far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, so I want to yeah. recap a few things here. Um, firstly, a great thing. Uh, this is actually one of my biggest gripes with the TSB chart and the concept of the TSB chart uh, is that it's just looking at physical stress and that's it. And, and mm -hmm. the difference between functional overreaching and non-functional overreaching in almost every conversation I've talked to, or I've heard discussed and, and been a part of, it's almost always talking about training volume, too much training volume or too little training volume. And that's the difference between it. But there are so many other factors that affect this, like Nate and, and yeah. Amber and Ivy have both mentioned, it could be a particularly stressful time in your life. And as a result, you need to train less because you have more stress coming into your life and you need to be able to sustain and, and be able to handle and process that stress, right? So if you're just dosing your life with, with physical stress from whether it's training on the bike or training in the gym, whatever else it's doing, and then you have more stress coming in your, I guess, training stress balance would be off, but the chart wouldn't tell you that chart would tell you you're fine. If you look at past history, you may have been able to do it before. So you might feel like I'm fine, but like Nate said, you'll always find that point. And that point is flexible. It will change from time to time. There may be a point in the future where you can handle way more than what you're doing now. There may be a point where you can handle less. And the same thing goes for the past, but, but, and this is a key point that Ivy pointed out you, yes, it's extremely important to listen to your body, but it's also extremely important to know that you may not be the best person to diagnose what's going on fully. And that's where having support people around you and professionals can really help you ride this balance in life, not just in training, but in life of functional versus non-functional overreaching. Super important stuff. Uh, really good tips, Ivy, on, on building a circle around you of different perspectives to help with that. For yeah, me too, it was a other... third therapy. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'll say too, for me, it was a third therapist that was like, right away. She's like, Hey, you're depressed. You should start this. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah. I'm like, I don't think I am. And then she gave me the Wellbutrin and then I was like, okay, I was, that was, this thing's dope. Uh, I feel so much better. And two Ivy, we should like have a metric of like, uh, tracking like our form stress of like typing in there, because that should be yeah. added into your training plan based on like who posts what on that day and what happens. Uh, That's a brilliant idea. Is. At the top of the forum, we should have a, a training stress chart or not just a stress chart. 
And if people are like overly mean in the forum, because that happens at times, uh, we turn everyone's people, workouts down. If it, they can see yeah. <laughs> of, over the whole thing. We just are like, do, do, do everyone's training stress a little bit too high right now. Everyone Future needs some API more integrations right there, by the way. That's interesting. Yeah. But, we detect um, your tone in the forum. Yeah. Sorry, John. Yeah, yeah, and then exactly. we then know, hey, you're a little uh, hangry right now. You're getting a little too much. Let's, uh, yeah. this is not constructive yeah. debate. This is getting personal. Therefore, you are a little irritable and we need to, to yeah, exactly. bring you back. But if we had like a chart that would be like, it's too high, then everybody could be like, you know what? I'm not going to be mean on the forum today. The stress input from the forum is really high. I'm going to be nicer today. <laughs> so that would what be if we had, what if this was a package you could get where as a partner, you could pay more. And if you wanted to dial back your partner's training volume, you could, <laughs> or you could schedule <laughs> rest weeks based on days. Oh, that like, like you want to go do something. Someone goes, hey, actually, we need to go to Costco that day. Let's not have the five hour ride in the morning. Let's I'm do a 30 minute of, ride. I'm thinking of Keegan and Sophia and that would, how that would be an absolute war zone with those two. Uh, Keegan yeah. would turn it up and be like, Sophia needs more. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. Sophia needs to do this six hour ride with me. And she'd just be turning him down because the more training he does, he's broken. It just, he, he gets even more excited by the whole thing. So, yeah. And I think though, that's a good point. It might, it's a joke, but sometimes to what Ivy's point and John's point, your partner sees it before you do. Mm -hmm. You don't think you're. Mm -hmm. When when you get ir irritable like this, when it first comes in, you are certain that your partner is doing something wrong, right? <laughs> it's not you. It work like that. They it's everyone did else. Something, <laughs> they did something, and you just are, and you are experiencing that emotion more. Where that partner could be doing the same thing all the time, and it's because you are uh, a tired, or overreaching, overtraining, some kind of state that you feel the emotion more. And you are not aware that your body is being impacted like that. And then you, you know, you, you could blame somebody who has no fault when it's really, you should be looking internal. So the point of having that good relationship with your partner is say, you know what? I think you might, um, your mood's a little bit different. Like I, I notice you're feeling these emotions more. Can we talk about this? And you as a person not say, no, nope, it's you. Cause you did blah, blah, blah. And not being defensive and really listening to that of somebody else, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, detecting that you are, that you're feeling your emotions more than usual. And what could be the root cause of that? Yeah. And that's why I think this, I'm so glad we covered this question because I look at what Craig's narrative is about their training and their mental health and feeling like they're weak. And um, so many parts of cycling don't make us feel like you have to be like tough guy, right? It's like <laughs> cycling is so much toxic masculinity, honestly that something is wrong with you if you can't bury yourself constantly. That's messed up. Yeah. That sucks. And especially with stuff like food and nourishing yourself and resting, like you're, you're, and, and the stuff we wrap up in our appearance and lots per KG and how the last thing you think you should do is just like nourish yourself and like take a bubble bath. Um, and you know, not all of us like, <laughs> yeah. have, not all of us are lucky enough to have, um, a partner or someone that we work close with or a family member that like sees us on a daily basis that sees those trends mm -hmm. and changes. And it's really hard for someone that, that has this mindset that you're weak. If you feel this way, that person probably isn't the kind of person that would be like, Hey, I don't feel good. I need help. What's mm -hmm. going on. Right. And so, yeah. and that's like super hard to decide to do and to know how to speak to it and to tell someone the full scope of everything that you're doing, especially someone that's not a cyclist or, or not a competitive athlete. You try to go to your regular primary care doctor and be like, this is what I deal with on a daily basis and for them to really, really understand. So it'll take some work to find someone that can look at the full scope of what you're doing and what you're eating and how much you're resting and what you're life looks like to really help you, but I urge you to do it. Mm. To quote, uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall, sometimes the best thing to do is to just do less. <laughs> like, Don't and do on, nothing. Don't do <laughs> <laughs> But I think that this is a great example of where sometimes the best way. To, so look, like let's return to an assumed goal of everybody with cycling is to improve yourself in one way or another. For some people, that's just achieving more balance and mental health because that's what the bike gives you. For some people, it's getting faster, um, whatever it might be. And if your goal is to do that, it, logically, we think I must do more to get more of the mm -hmm. outcome. But sometimes just doing less actually gets us more in the end. 
And I've found more often than not with all of us athletes listening to this, that are, well, there's, there's pro athletes too listening to this. So you actually, it's probably the same for you to a certain extent, but especially for those with complicated lives and, and lots of demands, many times the way to get faster is to do less than we think that we should do. And, or at least do less than we're putting pressure on ourselves to do. Look at the successful athletes podcast. So many of them just do low volume plans and they achieve a lot. So I hope Craig, that this was, uh, this was helpful for you, uh, to get some different perspectives. And I would absolutely encourage, like Ivy said, sometimes we don't have the luxury of having a person close to us in our lives to be able to provide additional perspective, but that's why also professional help is there. So then we can speak with those individuals and we can build a, a relationship with them and rapport so that they can understand where we're at. So uh, I would encourage everybody to do that, uh, to consider that, uh, normalize that. It's, it's, it's a way forward. It's a way to make progress. So uh, Nate, do you have one other thing before Nico's? Yeah, I just want to say uh, this is a general relationship thing. And I have totally been, I did this in my marriage and I, I want to tell other people to be aware of it is that when somebody is overtraining, overreaching, they haven't slept and, or they haven't eaten enough. Um, it's easy when they get upset to say, well, you're just hungry, right? Like you're just this. And what that does is that invalidates their feelings. And I did that as a husband is I would be like, you don't really feel that you're just hungry and let's get you some food to fix this. And that is, I've seen that all the time. I've seen that parents do that with kids. You're just tired. Your, your emotions don't matter. The, the difference is uh, how now I am teaching my kids and I want to do that is, Hey, you are, you're feeling this emotion. And in the moment, all I do is concentrate on the emotion of what she's, what, like my daughter might be feeling. We get through it. Then afterwards I teach her and say, uh, she'll even come to the re re realization. She goes, Oh, I wasn't really feeling that. I'm like, no, you were feeling that. But just when we're in these States, we feel them more. And if we can be aware that we're feeling them more, and then you as a partner or a person, you you, you almost validate them more. You work through it with that person. And then afterwards, when they're not in that state, you can talk about maybe you felt them more because of this, not that they were invalid because you were hungry. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge, I wish I would have learned that when I was like eight or something, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. Totally through my marriage. It's not a good personality trait, trying to always see it. And uh, because we are often around people who are hangry or because being in the cycling community, uh, that is a, that's something to be aware of. Great insight, Nate. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Appreciate that. Um, Nico's question. Lots of advice for training and racing focuses on identifying your rider type. And Nico says that in quotes, then developing and using those strengths to win races. What if you don't fit neatly into any specific category? Win them How all. do you choose? Sorry, say Sorry. that again, Nate. <laughs> you win them all. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. How do you choose what to focus on, whether in training or in your race strategy? For example, because I come from a distance running background, I'm most comfortable with long sustained or sustained threshold efforts. However, I am not a skinny featherweight, nor am I a large rider with high absolute power. Uh, Nico says they're 5'10 and 150 pounds. Therefore, I don't feel confident I can use sustained efforts to outclimb climbers on the hill or power away from diesels on the flats. And I definitely can't out sprint anyone. So any advice for the riders whose physiology doesn't match their physicality? That's a really good way to put it. When your physiology doesn't match your physicality. First of all, they Nico, you and I, we're, we are buds Same. on this uh, because I am 5'10", 150 pounds. Uh, so I, I can, well, we'll talk about this, but I, this resonates with me. Nate, uh, you had some I, thoughts. I, uh, real quick, what you do, Nico, is you cat down and clean up. <laughs> <laughs> cat down, clean up. <laughs> Sorry. I like okay. that. You guys go into the, the actual stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, is uh, Amber, I believe, or no, is this Ivy? Uh, do, you, do you have notes on this? I can't remember the color that we have. Um, who wants to jump in on this one first? Amber, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I... Um... It, to, to summarize my advice in a sentence, train everything and question all assumptions because, um, <laughs> already there are a lot of assumptions embedded in this, right. That my physicality doesn't match my physiology says who, I mean, mm. if we're talking about rider stereotypes, then yeah, I see where you're coming from. But if we step back and we accept that stereotypes are not always, you know, the, the rock solid truth, um, then that opens up a whole 
a whole new world of possibility, right? So you don't have to be a pure sprinter to have a really good snap. And I can tell you, I have known some incredible pure sprinters who don't have a sprinter physicality, right? Um, mm. I was terrible <laughs> Ivy, at sprinting. For those, for those watching, Ivy <laughs> was just <laughs> doing like a, a finger pointing in from the side of the zoom frame. <laughs> yep, me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you can and even, even say a, and sorry but you could even say that for yeah look at an athlete like corinne rivera like um yeah she she isn't like this like just this muscle bound huge athlete yet yeah, watch that woman sprint my goodness gracious mm -hmm. she can she can take off and sustain speed uh yeah. which Eric schneider yeah like, yeah exactly. so such a slight build like does not look like a track sprinter and just absolutely rolls some of the world's, you know, most stereotypical looking big sprinters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything yeah. to do with your build. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyway, sorry, right away. No, no, not at all. Right away. That's a huge assumption, right? So question that train your sprint. Um, the other assumption that I see in here is the assumption that, okay, this is what I, this is what I tended toward in running. And so this is what I think I'll tend toward in cycling. And I can tell you when I was a swimmer, I was a terrible, terrible sprinter. When I started cycling, I just assumed off the bat that I couldn't sprint turned out that I could. And as soon as I started training it, I actually had a really good snap. And by the end of my career, I was known for actually having a good sprint. Um, not a pure sprinter, but with training, I was able to have a really good snap that helped me initiate breakaways, went out of small groups. So there's a whole lot of, there's, there's just so much here that if you, um, step back, question those assumptions and start training different things, adopt a mentality of curiosity, right? Don't assume the outcome, get curious mm -hmm. about it. What if I started sprinting? What could I do? What if I worked on climbing? And another thing is, um, you mentioned that you, you don't feel confident in your ability to, to maybe out climb somebody. I can tell you a uh, <laughs> similar build. I was racing. I'm five ten. I was racing a lot around 150 pounds among women who were a lot, lot smaller than I was, and I could still win on mountaintop finishes. It's mm -hmm. your, your physicality is not your fate. Um, neither are stereotypes. So I just, uh, I'll conclude this by saying you don't know until you go. So just give it a shot, like mm -hmm. get curious, find out. Yeah. This is a, this is a big reason why we don't do rider typing in the app, because I think there is a mental disservice to so many athletes to think this is what I'm doing inside of this. And this is different than progression levels. Cause that's relative to what your FTP is, but the saying of like, Hey, you're a climber, you're a sprinter, you're a roller or something like that. I same way as Amber, I'm a big dude, one, one ninety or something. And, uh, I drop people on climbs and races. It's so much the so in racing. It's so much about belief in yourself and the mental aspect of it, of, mm -hmm. I'm going to go for this daring move right now. And everyone else thinks it's silly, but I'm just going to stick it and commit to it. It's a lot of times it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. And that has so much more to do with it than, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't born light enough to win on a climb. So therefore I'm never going to start climbing. Like, it sounds like Nico, like they, before the race, they already think I can't win these ways. Uh -huh. You can win in all these ways, mm -hmm. every single way. Yeah. I can't sprint. Have you guys seen me sprint? I've learned sprints <laughs> like it's, and it's more of like, it's, you just be smart and you position correctly and you, uh, use momentum on the last turn. And I went with like a thousand watt seated sprint. Like it is, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I at one ninety five, right. So that might be a lot of Watts for some people, but for other people, that's not. And, uh, John's got like a, what? 1300 watt sprint or something. 1400. Yeah. 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 14. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just saying like, don't, pigeon your whole self pigeonhole yourself into anything. It's like the, it's the worst thing you can do in life, but it's also bad in cycling. Everyone's mm -hmm. capable of so much more than they, it's like the, this is the motivation podcast. This, there's, <laughs> you're, you're more capable of what you realize. I, I guarantee you every single person here is selling themselves short. There's probably one mm -hmm. mega, mega, megalomaniac who is not everybody else is, <laughs> yeah. you can do more than what you believe in. And if you push out what your belief is, you're going to fill that space with how you perform. Hmm. That's the way it is. Yeah. Well said, I will man. say I always struggled with confidence. I still do to an extent. Um, 
but one of the things that really helped me was because I would always say like, oh, it's, it's really hard for me to go from not believing myself to believing myself. That just felt like such a huge step. Like, how do I convince myself that I'm capable of doing this? Because my brain works in a very evidence-based way. So if I haven't <laughs> done it yet, I'm not sure I can until I do. And that's a really frustrating way of, it's, it makes it very hard to build confidence. Uh, what helped me a lot was getting curious because then mm. you, you're not ruling anything out you stop telling yourself stories about what you can and can't do. And you just open your mind and say, let's find out, let's go see. And that relieved a lot of pressure because it was like, okay, um, if you, if you can get to a place where you can believe in yourself, do it because I a hundred percent agree with Nate. Most people are selling themselves short. If you are a megalomaniac in cycling, you will be humbled very fast. This sport Mm -hmm. is not good for most people's egos because it's really hard to win. And cycling is really hard. The training is tough. Um, The learning curve is steep. It's a lot of fun and it's really rewarding. But for most of us, our egos can take a beating. It's okay. Just get get curious and adopt a growth mindset where you're here to learn and just learn to get better every day. And if you learn one thing every day that you can apply, you're on a great track. I have this idea, Amber, that like, I've thought about this before, where there's this like narcissist that races that never thinks that they can't do it. And they're just an awesome racer. They lose all the time, but they're just like, that's just because the pavement was wrong. And like, they (laughs) they come right back in the next time and they just, there's just confident again and they keep going for it and they end up racing pretty well because they never go, I'm not good enough because they think of themselves so highly. Right. Um, and that can happen with regular people. That would be nice. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, the other part is that the, the writer types, I've said this before that it really, it really does matter at the really high world tour level, but Amber just gave us one of the biggest women in the, in the Peloton out climbing people at the world tour level, which that's an example right there. And then, uh, you see other things like, like Wout Van Aert beating people mm-hmm. in a sprint who are pure and sprinters. mountaintop finish. It, exactly. Same tour. <laughs> like, that's, that is insane. And I, I wonder how many people are in the Peloton who don't consider themselves their spinners. So they never work on their sprint and they don't realize that because that was the, that was the conventional wisdom. No way you can win a mountain type top finish and be a sprinter. Eddie Merckx, Mm -hmm. maybe other than that is not going to happen. And while it's like, I sprinted a bunch in in uh, cyclocross, like why I've been doing this forever. Like, why can't I do it here too? And so he shows up and he tries and then he wins. Mm Mm-hmm. Ivy. They never put themselves in the position to try to sprint. I think everyone said being right. curious and like trying that stuff. Yep. And I don't, I don't, I feel there's so much attachment around knowing what kind of cyclist you are. And I feel mm. like other road cyclists do that to each other. We always seek a, identity, right? We like seek ways to identify ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Not a human and thing. the things that Nico can focus on is like, I don't know if I'm a sprinter, but I'm going to get really good at being in the right spot in the last corner and focus on that. And I'm going to do it every time or like learn how to do it or mm. going to learn how to like launching an attack with a K to go and being the best at that and learning that that's a skill that you can do. Like what kind of writer does that make you? It doesn't make you a type of writer. It makes you really know yourself and it means you've developed some really intricate, tough skills that don't put you in a writer type of being a sprinter or a climber or whatever. Mm. Makes it super yeah, that, fun. That's mm-hmm. a really good point. Cause it's not just about the physicality either, but there's a whole layer of tactics there, right. And a whole psychological game at play here that you can tap into as well. So, um, hundred percent, not just about writer type, like on a physical level, on a tactical level, on a mental level, just give it a go, see what you can do. Nico, I'd like to encourage you to play chess, not checkers on this. So everyone else (laughs) will put every other rider into a box. So when you're in a race, you will look at another rider and you will say, oh, Nate's tall. Nate's not going to do well on a climb. That rider looks really muscly, maybe small. Looks like they can get out. That rider is going to be a good sprinter. Somebody's going to try to put you into a box. And I would challenge you once again to play chess, not checkers and experiment with that, do unexpected things and do things when people aren't expecting it. Cause that's the coolest part about road racing. It's, I mean, it's, it's basically just gambling. It's people putting down bets and those bets are paid in terms of, of, you know, physical strain. Right. 
but people are putting down bets all the time in a road race and, and bets are made wrong and it happens and you could make a good bet and you could totally flip that deck and change it on them. Uh, Amber, uh, you have something to say on that? I just have a funny story to share. So speaking yeah. of tactics, this comes back when I was in elementary school back in the day, I, we like to do like mini ad hoc little running races on the, on the playground. <clears throat> and I was a pretty fast runner at the time. Um, not so anymore, but anyway, there was, now a kid it comes who was out. Really, really... she's actually going to be really good at triathlon. Now, it's, now we know she was a childhood runner, a prodigy. Some might say, yeah, you know, already... prodigy, right. <laughs> yeah. So there was a kid that me and this other kid were really, really like, we were kind of, we were fast. And so we, somebody challenged us to race each other to determine like who was the fastest kid on the, on the playground. So the challenge was to run across the playground, touch the fence and come back. And the first person to finish was going to be the winner. I'll tell you what I did. I went out way too fast on purpose. Like I went at a dead sprint all the way across the playground. We touched the fence and he gave up nice. and I won. There we, I knew takes. I wasn't going to be able to sustain that pace, but I just, I psyched him out mentally and one by default. So this is Amber's it's, it's not story. just physical. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the refiner's fire, the crucible where Amber was born. <laughs> <laughs> very I, I, silly silly story but hey you know it's yeah. not just about fitness <laughs> mental games that yeah. happens on climbs all the time though uh they totally. go out at uh -huh. such a hard pace that they just want the this is like the cycling thing you start out so hard and someone goes i can't do this and you hold on for like 30 more seconds they drop out around a corner and you've got three. an easy climb right yeah yep. they lose contact and they just mentally give up thinking that you're gonna be able to hold this the whole time yeah uh, the other part that that is in here is in my whole my whole life actually i a lot of times i'm probably giving away too much i <laughs> position myself to be underestimated on purpose and mm -hmm. you have to be able to not like people will say things about you and you cannot correct them because you know they're inaccurate but then when you show up over when it matters mm. it like you can do your thing and uh they go that's weird that's not like nate he got lucky um, but it puts you into a position where they're not as concerned about you or focused on you. This happens in business and in sport and other stuff too. And it's a, it's a nice place to be, to be underestimated. Once mm -hmm. we started putting all those videos online and it showed that I could win a bunch of races, it actually was really bad for my racing because John <laughs> too, because then you get yeah. like marked and stuff <laughs> totally. uh, like that because it, a lot of people saw it. But, uh, before that me saying, I don't know how to race, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it helped with the podcast and then you win all the races and then, it, then it makes it harder. So just that idea of being underestimated, amazing. Uh, especially if you're doing things that are not look what, like your body type does. So mm -hmm. people go, Oh, we're going to drop Amber on this climb. And Amber goes, Oh, I'm so tired. I can't do this. Oh my goodness. Bam. And then she like turns it on <laughs> and everyone goes, what is wrong with this world? My whole idea, uh, I have cognitive dissonance in my head and I can't handle this and I'm going to drop out. Yep. I, I, I'm bad at assessing situations. It makes them doubt everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Something's wrong yeah. with my body today. Cause am of all people, Amber should not be dropping me because she is taller than me and weighs more than me. How could this be happening? I must have a bad day. My chain needs to be waxed, obviously. Uh, and that's the, that's, <laughs> hey, the that's reason. where it got too personal. That's you. Yeah. <laughs> but the more you can do that, it, it's good. It's, it's a good sure. thing. I, I want to, this is an interesting point that you made, Nate. I've never heard anybody else talk about a competitor like that. You mentioned that narcissist that gets beat down, but then still comes back the next week believing. There's a, a people that like motocross and remember an athlete named Chad Reed. He'd raced for he had a super long career. And that guy was the perennial second place his whole career, but he showed up every single week believing he could win. Like, and it's funny when you talk to people that were inside his inner circle, like he never once was like disillusioned, right? He was never like, oh gosh, I can't do it. He just went back the next week and he knew that week he could win. And it, honestly, it didn't happen because of generational like overlap. He was with the best of the best that have ever existed in that sport at that time. Now, all of us racing locally, you will be in a position where you may be lining up against people that are so much better than you. And as a result, if they beat you on a climb, you'll think you're not a climber. Or if they beat you in a sprint, you'll think you're not a sprinter. And it's really important to not listen to that and to instead mm -hmm. go back to it and approach it with curiosity. Like Amber said, whatever somebody else does has no bearing on who you are. It's, it's what you choose to do and you can race however you plan to race. 
So approach it with curiosity. Amber's like trademark saying that we should put on a t-shirt. It's awesome. And it'll you make you, it'll, it'll help you learn new things about yourself to do this metaphor of bikes too. It's really cool. It'll put yourself into, it'll put you into unique situations that you wouldn't encounter otherwise. And you don't have to be a narcissist to have that. Yes. It's, good point. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just, just so you know, it, it's just easier, I think for that person, but the, you totally, you can get there the other way and be perfectly healthy and just, and it's true. Every race you can win. And just yeah. because you made a bad one before or got dropped before does not change that fact. Yeah. It's funny that Chad Reed guy, he's retired now, but even in interviews and you listen to him, he's like, yeah, I could come back and win. He's like, you know, overweight and everything else. So yeah, I could do it. Like, yeah, it's like, no big deal. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. He has no, yeah, that switch is broken. So Matt's question. He says, Hey guys, big fan of the podcast. We often hear about fitness plateaus. And I was wondering how much time without improvement does it take to consider yourself in a plateau? So the actual measurement of one, in other words, after how much time without considerable, considerable improvement, should I reassess my training approach and structure? Thanks so much for all, for all that you do. Uh, Ivy, do you want to, um, chair on this one first, <laughs> kick us off? The <laughs> only thing <laughs> I have to contribute to this is that my plateaus often show up retrospectively. Which sucks. Like, yeah. I always look back. I'm like, whoops, that was the time when I did it. <laughs> oh. How do you That's recognize it. them? Like, like, what do you look back or what, what, um, why don't you recognize them in the moment? And why do you recognize them later? What signs are you seeing? I feel like for the type of writer that I am, I see my plateaus in repeatability of effort. Um, it's hard for me to just look at strictly numbers that doesn't really speak to for like shorter efforts, how I'm feeling. But then when I do a race or a race group ride and I feel like I hit higher numbers consistently and look back at the effort and think, oh, whoa, that was, that didn't feel strenuous. That felt really good. I could have done that for an hour more. That's when I look back and go, whoa, that was the time that I plateaued. <laughs> mm. Yeah. How about, uh, Nate, have you like going through plateaus? What things do you notice or feel when you're going through a plateau? Yeah, it, it's going to matter your training history and how much volume you can take and your lifestyle and how consistent you've been. Because some people I, I've seen it, they're not consistent and they're like, I'm in a plateau. It's like, no, you just like you, you, you miss a workout every other week and it's going to be tough to do that. Other people, you might a five watt gain year over year might be pretty big. And you might say that's a plateau, but you might actually just be close to where your maximum training load is for your lifestyle. And you're probably not in our world of like your maximum capabilities because of lifestyle, like your magic, magic, your magical, your maximum uh, <laughs> <That too. laughs> and magical uh, <laughs> physiological capabilities, but there's a balance there. Right? So when you do plateau, some people think they either need to, uh, one is change the whole training philosophy, like everything needs to change or two, it is, uh, more volume and it could be a lot, lots of other stuff. It could be the, the workouts that you're picking. It could be the recovery between workouts. It could be the sleep that you're getting. It could be the, uh, nutrition that you're doing both on and off the bike. Those could be reasons why you're plateauing. And I would say that if I was doing a whole block of train road workouts, and I could not increase my levels at all. So mm -hmm. I can't every time I'm at a five threshold and I could just not get a 5.2 or a 5.3 at all. Like I just keep going back to five and can't do it. And then each one of those, I can't move forward at all. And I'm not overly tired and I got everything else done. I would say that's a plateau. And what I might do is add more volume, do longer workouts, that sort of thing to increase it. But that's only if I can take it based on this, you know, I'm a happy mood and all that sort of stuff. Most people aren't going to do that. And it's consistency. If you're consistent and you're increasing your levels, you can be really fast. As John said on the, how many of our uh, successful athlete podcast people do amazing things on low volume, like three workouts a week. A huge amount. We actually just uh, had mm -hmm. a blog post that we put out on this. You can go to trainerroad.com slash blog. And it highlights examples of athletes that are doing extraordinary things on low volume plans. There's a lot of them, a huge amount. So yeah. Like what, what kind of things are they doing? Oh yeah. Uh, winning uh, Ironman age group world championships, 
uh, winning <laughs> crazy, right? <laughs> pretty amazing, <laughs> right? Um, winning state championships and national championships, fitting in training while they're being a parent and everything else and still competing at like the state level and doing well, achieving PRs, like life, that's a big thing too. Achieving lifetime PRs with low volume training because in our mind that breaks, right? Because we're like, no, I need to do more to get more. But once again, it's a good example of doing less and getting more out of it. There is this, this part two, if you're plateaued where instead of adding more volume, you add more rest between and the harder days get harder, right? Mm -hmm. So low volume is easy on that because you don't have to do the hard days, their, their rest days. And as long as you don't fill them with something else, and then just make sure those levels keep increasing, you're no longer plateaued. And the nice thing about that with the um, new adaptive training is that you don't have to wait four to six weeks to see if you're getting stronger. That next workout, you can see week over week, did I increase my levels? Boom, you are actually stronger. It is no longer a plateau. Mm. Yeah, Amber. Um, I just want to tie this back to what we were talking about earlier with overreaching, because these two things can be connected and Phil in the live chat just pointed this out. And it's absolutely true. Um, cause when you get into an overreaching state that can feel like a plateau and that can, that might, you know, depending on your situation that could tip over into non-functional overreaching. Um, but I also just kind of want to step in here and just say, uh, there's different ways of tracking progress and we know that progress is not linear. So it is possible that you can go for a period of time without seeing substantial, um, increase in fitness, if that's your benchmark of progress. And then suddenly your body adapts to a training load. Your, your body's not going to adapt in a linear fashion, right? It's not going to adapt the same amount every single day. You're not going to see this perfect linear stepwise improvement. What usually happens is you don't see much improvement and then bam, all of a sudden your body adapts and you feel like you're just leveled up. Mm. Um, and so sometimes it feels like when progress isn't linear, it feels like that because it's very slow, but then sometimes it can feel really fast. And that's the mm -hmm. beauty. There's two sides of progress isn't linear. Um, but if you are going through a prolonged period of time and you have other symptoms aside from not seeing your power numbers go up or other benchmarks of training progress, um, you're feeling down, you're really not motivated. You're on an emotional roller coaster. Uh, that's when you want to start looking at things like recovery, nutrition, uh, see if some of those things might help too. Cause it might not just be a plateau. It might be just a couple of little levers that you need to, you need to tweak and you might be good. I wanted to share something too, to normalize plateaus because sometimes a plateau is okay. Like, and now I assume in this case, Matt, uh, Matt is reaching up because Matt doesn't want to be in a plateau, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's okay. Don't feel the pressure as an endurance athlete to just always be like, I was talking about joking around with Nate before, but always be up, right. Always be going up, up, up. Sometimes the plateau is okay. Uh, another thing, uh, this is a great comment from Cliff Baranowski in the live chat. He says progression levels got me through my plateau. I was probably mm -hmm. doing too many achievable or stretch workouts before progression levels rolled out. I'm now focusing on more productive workouts, which made a huge difference. So I want to define that for people that don't use trainer road yet. So we define your workouts as achievable is something that you've proven you can do, or, uh, the way the AI or the way that adaptive training is adapt or analyzing you, it knows that you can do that work. So that's achievable. That might look like a sort of workout that you can do, or you don't feel like you're really pushed to the limits at all. You just feel like, yeah, I nailed it. Solid workout. Easy. Not, not too tough. Then after that is productive and productive is that, is that, and part in the term sweet spot, but it's that, that area where you want to be, where you're getting enough benefit from the work being stretched, like Amber was saying, but not too much so that you can recover and still do more work thereafter and following days. And then after that, we have stretch workouts and stretch workouts are still something that you could do, but they are going to be difficult to complete. And in our training plans, you will rarely get a stretch prescribed. I can't think of a situation where you'll get one, but I could be wrong, but they are not intentionally prescribed in almost every case. And then after that you have stretch, then you get into not recommended workout or breakthrough workouts, which that's like a huge one where you have bumped up a bunch of levels and then there's not recommended. So that's the context. So what he is saying here is he is saying that he was doing too much, too many workouts that were either too easy or too hard. And now he's doing just the right amount of difficulty workouts. And as a result, he is getting more improvement. And this is one thing that I want to mention with plateauing. Plateauing, it could be happening for any number of reasons. It could be happening because of bad training prescription. You're just not getting pushed enough or you're getting pushed too much. Both of those things can cause a plateau. They may mm -hmm. feel different. Both can cause a plateau. 
once again, we're bad at kind of understanding what we're actually feeling most of the time. Another thing that could be causing this too is nutrition, is rest, is sleep. You may actually be doing the right training, but it's not the right training for the amount you're able to recover from. So your stress, once again, can't outpace your rest too much. It needs to be in proper proportion. So if you have a new job and it's really difficult right now, maybe your training is what you could physically handle, but because of the new stress in your life, you need to step it back a little bit. But the one thing I'm breaking out of a plateau is to try something different, try something unique. Uh, this is a really, and an, an easy way on a small scale that you can do this within trainer road is workout alternates. You can just look for a different type of workout. So for example, if you're doing VO two max work and you've been doing long sustained VO two max work, try switching it up with short shorts where you're just doing the 30 thirties and threshold work. If you've been doing over unders, try stuff. That's the stuff that's just underneath for hard starts, just like changing up. Even those training stimulus on a small side can actually have an impact and make it so that you can start improving again or it's flipping the deck. You can swap out your training plan for a different one, work on short power instead of sustained, do something else uh, that's totally different or take some rest. But the point is plateaus happen because we usually either aren't being pushed enough or we're being pushed too hard. And as a result, our body can improve and the way to improve it. And I know this sounds super logical is change in stimulus. Um, but in most cases, if you're plateauing, if this is why adaptive training is so nice is because you don't have to question whether it's too much or not enough because it's well calibrated to you. But most of the time, if you're plateauing, first thing I would look at is your rest, just to not put yourself deeper in a hole. Like, am I training too much for what I can recover from? And then look at adding on more thereafter. Nate, did you have something yeah. to add? Amber said about the, uh, progress is not linear <clears throat> in my experience. And Pete and I talked about this before and Amber, I want your opinion, Amber and Ivy, actually all of us, that time where you, <clears throat> excuse me, you might be, you you feel like stalled. It's usually because of an increase in volume and you, so you do an increase in volume. And I had this where I like, I jumped to like all two hour workouts and I had a month of being like stale where like, I really wasn't moving up so much. I could do it, but I didn't, I didn't feel like I had snap. And then I recovered and had a couple more like bad. And then I bumped up Then I did a ramp test and it was like, boom, like my body suddenly recovered from that amount of large amounts of work. And I move forward. And that can happen. If you increase your, you increase your volume so much that you need recovery and you can't get that bump until you get the recovery. It's, it's mm -hmm. like the, uh, functional overreaching where you go down, right? Uh, that is one way to do it. It is kind of hard to do. And it's an easy, it's like, it's kind of dangerous. I think pros are probably better at it than non-pros. Uh, dangerous in the way that you could go too much, but that can also happen. So instead of being, you know, progressively go up, you up your volume, do the same types of workouts, recover, and then you get the boost. Uh, I'll start with Amber. Is that your experience too with that? Like training camp could be another example of this, right? You do a training camp, you're like stale for a while, and then you suddenly absorb it. Yep, exactly. And it, de it depends on the writer, right? For some people that's going to be volume for some people that's going to be intensity. And I will say at the professional level, and this doesn't apply to everybody, but you get to a point where you know exactly what you need for your legs to be super sharp. And what you're describing is what I would have referred to as feeling flat. So it's not that I'm not capable of racing and competing, but I just feel flat. I don't have that nice sharp snap. Um, so what we would do is for example, if we were going into in my early years, we, we often had back-to-back -back stage races. So I might have three weeks worth of continuous stage racing with maybe one or two days between in a massive block. And in that case, I might actually want to go into that block a little bit flat because the racing and the recovery, you know, recovering appropriately between stages and races would actually help me move into that state of feeling really sharp and snappy. Um, so we would learn what things would help us feel sharp versus what things would make us flat. And we would tweak that timing a little bit so that it would coincide with, um, a target race, for example, but absolutely that is definitely the case. And it's something that everybody as an individual can pay attention to. What are the things that make you feel flat? Um, and then what are the things that you can do to help you adapt and compensate and get that nice super compensation. So you start to feel really sharp. How about you, Ivy? Uh, yeah, some, sometimes I do that on accident <laughs> 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 because you get really excited. The bike racing is back after, you know, 
a year and change or two years or whatever <laughs> and you just want to ride do a bunch of volume and intensity with your friends and then you go do your first block of uci cross races and suck <laughs> and it's like <laughs> so flat it was so bad and i seriously contemplated like quitting it's like this what did you change yeah. on that like because i remember that period of time like uh it was really frustrating because before prior to that you were like i'm flying i'm ripping like this is awesome and then you got to the races and you just weren't so what did you change was it resting more or i didn't less? rest before after that time before going to race and mm. i didn't rest enough and then once i got on the road and started racing couldn't chill out and take a rest period and so after that first block i took a rest and just like cried deeply and thought about quitting and I was like, all right, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, let's, let's try it again. And sure enough, as soon as I started working back into it, I felt way better and felt like myself again and snappy. And yeah, so that, whoops, that was a mistake. I, I like picture our body just being like anytime now, just like waiting for that rest. Like you've given me plenty <laughs> of stress anytime now, where's the rest? And then like, we keep giving it stress. It's like, okay, I guess I'll deal with that again. Okay. I'll deal with it again. And it's just like, just give me rest. And then I can, it was hard fast. to tell myself that I wanted rest when I was feeling so good. I was like, why? Yeah. No, don't slow down now. Mm -hmm. Like it's coming. Well, that's like, so relatable. Yeah. Like yeah. for all of us, right. When we're flying, why in the world would we not spend more time on our bike? Because that's more awesome things we can do. Like that's mm -hmm how it works, but in our minds, but it's not how it works physically. <laughs> you know? I forget where I heard this saying, but somebody said, don't waste good legs on training. Mm. I like that. <laughs> attacked yeah, so many times. <laughs> yeah. so many times. Personally, <laughs> personally attacked, but Hey, <laughs> it's fine. We can move past it. <laughs> John, that was almost John's like MO for a while was the last interval on a trainer road workout. I'm going to go all out. Like it's a race winning effort. Yeah. I wouldn't say it was an MO, but it's the temptation that I would give into when I would start feeling fast. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, oh, it's yeah. That's yeah. It. yeah. It's and, and boy, don't we all face that? That's for sure. Uh, so hopefully in this case, uh, we've given some good advice, uh, Matt and some, some context on plateauing and how to break through it. Uh, let's go to Flora's question. She says, Hey, trainer road team, long time listener and new trainer road user. I've already seen a 10% increase in FTP from December to January. Thanks to adaptive training and the structured workouts way to go 10%. Um, awesome. and I, I do unspeakable things for 10% right now. That would be sweet. <laughs> uh, my question is where and how to find the ideal women's trial or women's time trial saddle. Does it remain trial and error? And if I can, we are going to focus this on women's saddles, but then Nate and I, can we talk about men's tri time trial saddles too afterward? Because I don't Nate says no. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I will. <laughs> and people in the live strong. chat, it, maybe you can help me out with this. But anyways, uh, Flora says, I've tried the ISM Pro 3.1 and the Pro Stealth. And those are two different brands. ISM is the brand. That's the Pro 3.1. And the pro stealth, that's like pro bike components. It's an arm of Shimano, I believe. So pro stealth mm -hmm. is the name of that saddle and the Sally SMP. And then, uh, Flora mentions from chafing to bruising the pubic bone, none work. Well, I heard that pro women get saddles made for them ideal, but unrealistic for most of us. Why does it seem so hard for women to find the right saddle? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Keep up the great work. Uh, have any of you had a, a saddle custom made for you? I know Specialized does that mirror thing, but I don't know if they ever got to the point where they're making custom ones. Well, my my saddles are handmade in Missoula. They're called Catahoula Ergonomics. They're super great, but they're not custom made. I'm like, this is, sounds like something that some like bro would say to a woman like on a group ride when she's like, oh, I'm in saddle trouble. Like some dude would be like, oh yeah, well, I heard the pro women get their saddles custom made. You got to get a custom. No, no, we don't. Like, can you imagine the process for that also? Like sitting in some sort of like goop, goopy mold to make a perfect style for you that doesn't exist. It's not. Also, it'd be impossible no. if it's the TT position because I still am confused at how any saddle can be good for a TT position. It's crazy. Like, right. Is, is, yeah. is discomfort inherent? Like, is that just part of it? And, and, and Ivy, I actually have no clue how much time you spent on a TT bike. Um, so I don't know, uh, what your experience is with that, but, um, a bit when I was racing road professionally and did all the stage races and stuff. Um, but I feel 
I feel like with track specifically and with doing a lot of crits and being in a really like Mm. forward rolled position, really aggressive position, I used to ride TT saddles just all the time in some instances, depending upon the bike I was on and fit um, because of how that forward rotated. I was Mm -hmm. in my position that was akin to a time trial position. Um, So yeah, I tried a bunch of TT saddles and some of them worked for me for a while and some of them didn't. And sometimes I had teams where our clothing sponsor had really bad chamois and that was the problem, not the saddle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it's unfortunately trial and error. According to my opinion. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just laughing about this idea of women getting custom saddles at the pro level because the, the custom saddles that I witnessed were pro women actually modifying their own saddles to make them work for them. Because often what happens is we don't get a choice. So we have a saddle sponsor and we have to ride that brand. You have a choice of models most of the time not always. Um, and so you can get in really big trouble for riding the incorrect saddle. So I knew women who would actually take a lighter and melt out a cutout in the plastic piece underneath the saddle. They would go in and and sew on different fabrics. I mean, the, the, the range of modification was huge. And I will tell you, this was not a provided service. This was something that people were (laughs) hacking together in their kitchens, um, out of a, like, survival instinct. Right. Um, and I'll share it one season. Uh, there was a particular brand. I won't say which brand we were sponsored. Mm-hmm. And I did one training ride on my TT bike with a saddle and was like, this is medically concerning and not possible. Like I can't, I can't actually use the saddle. And so I asked to be able to use a different saddle for tr- for TTs because it was, I literally got a note from my doctor <laughs> in order to <laughs> present this and nope, it was a no go. So out of self-preservation, I just, I didn't do time trials that year. And if I had to do a time trial during a stage race, I basically kind of sat up to, <laughs> per, <laughs> to survive because, you know, there would be multiple days of racing after that. Um, so it is not just rainbows and puffy clouds for the pro women. Um, this is a struggle for all of us and it is trial and error. Like Ivy said, um, I think one of the things that's a little bit frustrating is this is a relatively new thing that brands are looking at, right? This was not something that was really done, researched, experimented with 20, 30 years ago, like women specific saddles is a new idea, relatively speaking. And a lot of the first saddles that came out were really marketing, right? It was, it was the optics of having a women's specific saddle. It wasn't functionally doing anything that was going to be helping that is getting a lot better. And I think that the benefit to this is for everyone, regardless of gender, uh, because everybody is different shapes and sizes. Everybody has different needs. Um, and there's no one size fits all. I will say when it comes to time trialing in particular, it is hard to find a saddle that isn't going to give you some kind of discomfort. Um, it should not cross over to the point of being medically concerning. It should be, it should absolutely be at a minimum tolerable. Um, comfortable might be a lofty goal, but getting to Mm -hmm. a point where it's tolerable and it's not doing, you know, and you can recover from whatever discomfort on a training ride relatively quickly. Like that would be probably a good, a good goal. I don't think there's any like a general, uh, or generalizations are tough with saddles too. You can't say that like you're a woman, therefore you need this width or do you need a cutout or you need a snub nose or whatever else on the saddles. There's a, I think that it varies right from, from athlete Mm -hmm. to athlete. In some cases, uh, a men's saddle may work best for you. A women's saddle may work best for a man. I see a lot of men with Mm -hmm. uh, specialized power uh, mimic, I think saddle, the one that's a women's specific saddle, but it's also just really comfortable because <laughs> like the front is extremely soft. It's like almost not there. So, I, I mean, there's saddles are trial and error for sure. Um, uh, Ivy, you mentioned Catahoula uh, are the saddles that you have, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Amber, do you ride fabric saddles? I don't know, know what you ride. Which saddle do you uh, prefer these days? 
I have a mix. So um, I'm trying to think. I like a Prologo Dimension is one. And I also change it up with the ISM Adamo because um, now I can pick whatever saddles I want. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I actually, <laughs> I, I do like mixing it up a little bit because then um, I'm not always getting the pressure points in the same places. And that's kind of nice. Yeah. Uh, Nate, a saddle that you prefer? Are you a power guy? Is that the one you use? The wide specialized mirror. Mirror. Which okay. is uh, annoying because it's the super expensive one. Yeah. And, but it was such a big improvement that I bought them for all the bikes. And I can even yeah. get like a TT position on it, but wow. it's just so expensive and ridiculous, yeah. but hopefully I can have that one forever now. I use the pro logo dimension. That's the one I like. Um, and that one in terms of like, I've actually never had a person that has tried it that said that, oh, I can't stand it. I've had people try it that say, I still prefer one or the other, but it's a, they, they like it. It seems like it's a pretty agreeable shape. Um, but once again, these are just like N equals one, but four of those. And who knows if they actually work? I just figure it's probably worth our time while we're talking about to share what we, we uh, use. For TT saddles, I have no clue. I have tried the Specialized had a time trial saddle. It was the most uncomfortable thing I've used. Uh, I have a Trek one that kind of is like an open front. like a, It looks like an ISM Adamo. Uh, and when I use that one, I feel like I'm, my pelvis is being like wedged apart. Uh, I can't find, and I don't even know if any, like if Ironman athletes actually, I don't know if they're honest. Um, hopefully we can find some that don't have like saddle sponsors and then they can be honest because I don't know how that's comfortable to ride that long, 112 miles in your aero position. They may go in and out of that position, but the top athletes are in there for like the whole time. And man, to just be sitting there on those really uncomfortable saddles, especially with triathlon, since they're really pushed forward, they tend to be in a more rotated forward pelvis position too, than like a UCI governed TT position. So man, it's, I, I don't know. I, maybe it's just everyone's suffering silently. Oh, some people actually are. I've talked to a lot of age groupers and they can, some people are totally comfortable in the whole position, like arms, neck, that you can just go forever. I envy those people so much. Uh, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Oh, my. And I've, I've always had issues. <laughs> you don't envy them. I mean, yeah. No, I don't buy it. Oh yeah. Oh. I don't yeah. buy them. <laughs> cause so Nate, it's particularly hard for you cause you're so tall. And then like getting a bike to fit right. And then extensions, like everything mm -hmm. has to be custom to the nth degree. Um, so, but the saddle still, regardless of like everything else, the saddle is such a key part. So, uh, Flora, I don't know. We might have not have helped you at all in this case. I am sorry, <laughs> but hopefully we gave you some perspective at least. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. I think um, a good starting point is bike fit. So make sure that you've got a good bike fit and that you're working from a good position because position is going to matter a lot when you're talking mm. about the type of saddle. Um, the other thing is to remember, like Ivy mentioned, the bib shorts make a huge difference too. So one pair of bib shorts might play nice with one saddle and not with another. So that's another mm. factoring component. So if you're going to be testing out saddles, start with a good bike fit, then make sure that you're testing saddles in the shorts that you plan on racing in so that you know that those are going to play nice in that particular combination. Um, and then from there, it, it really is trial and error, uh, which can get expensive, but talk to your local bike shops. A lot of them have demo programs where you can demo a saddle, um, mm -hmm. and, and go from there. See if you can test them out and, and test them for a good while, like give them a good, give them a good, um, some, put some mileage on there and play around with the intensity on the bike so that you're really getting a feel for how that feel on the saddle is going to change depending on how hard you're riding. And with bike fits, just like doctors and a diagnosis, I would recommend second and third opinions on bike fits. Just I've seen a whole lot of professional bike fits that get people in some wacky positions. So uh, regardless, unless you're using a system like retool or something else, that's using like principles to guide you toward the right bike fit. You're just trusting an individual. You're trusting their perspective on bike fit. So that's also a layer of trial and error. I'm so sorry, Flora. Um, hopefully, I, I hope you can find the saddle that works for you quickly uh, through all this. It took yeah, me good years. Good luck to you. For what's worth. Yeah. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Calvin's question. Uh, thanks always for the killer advice. I have a race travel logistics question. I've been known to do multi-day drives to get to races, but I've never flown to a race before. This year, it looks like I'll have more funding, but tighter travel windows, and it seems like at least a few times 
it may make a lot more sense to fly. However, it seems like flying to a bike race requires a whole new level of planning and logistical thinking, unless you're on a team that manages that for you. And I've thought about that in the times I'm like, uh, when I travel to races and stuff, I'm like, man, I really like not being part of a team, but this is when I would love to be a part of a team, to have somebody else have a pump and to have somebody else have like all this stuff, maybe my nutrition. So I don't have to pack it up. Oh, that'd be great. He says, I find this pretty intimidating. I know that you talk about lots of races that I assume you have flown to, and certainly there are many athletes who do it all the time. Would you be able to provide an overview of strategies and tips for flying to a bike race? Specific challenges I worry about involve packing lighter. I usually cram my car full with my bike, a pump, spare wheels, all my apparel, lots of nutrition items, tools, and more. Dealing with rental car companies that may not be thrilled with you loading a bike into their vehicles, airline delays and cancellations affecting your ability to actually make it to the race, and all of this adding up to a general increase in pre-race anxiety. I uh, appreciate the help as always. Um, so two strategies that I want to point out, two different ways that you can do this. One, you can use bike flights or a similar service. You can just ship your bike. All bike flights does, and I, I apologize if I'm misunderstanding the business, but all bike flights does is it, it's like an easier user interface to send a bike. Whereas if you take your bike to like a standard shipping place, they might be like, whoa, I don't even know what to do with something this big. Bike flights will let you print a label and, and it makes it really easy. So you can well, use bike. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll interject because I used to work for bike flights. And if you okay. place a bike flights order, you see my face telling you how to like safely ship your bike. It's pretty funny. <laughs> sorry about it. <laughs> Another perk uh, then of using bike, fl yeah. bike flights, you get happy Ivy. <laughs> it's Ivy from like five lifetimes ago too. And I have like long brown hair and I'm super basic. And yeah, it's funny. <laughs> but uh, So bike flights also has a, uh, they're offered a high volume discount from UPS because they ship so many bikes that it's so much mm. cheaper than if you as an individual were to go into UPS or, you know, and, and be like, how much to ship this bike? So they pass along big discount to you, but then also you can arrange a UPS pickup from your house or hotel. Um, so once you're at the race and you, um, like pre-print your labels, basically you just put in your dimensions and your shipping locations and pre-print your labels. And you can pre-arrange a UPS pickup from wherever you're staying for your race or from your house or whatever. So those are all services that bike flights have. Sorry. Andy, yeah. uh, in terms of cost, what I've seen now, especially since airlines are lowering or dropping their, their fees, bike flights would be a bit more expensive than most of the airlines that you fly. Not all. Some airlines are really expensive. Some are really cheap. Depends. Um, Southwest is $75 per bike or each way here in the United States. That's a common airline, uh, that people will take like a domestic airline Whereas United, I think it's free now. Uh, I think they dropped their bike fee. I believe that American or Delta, I think American Delta did too. Delta it did just can't American too, has yet to. Yeah. Just can't be too heavy. Yep. Alaska airlines, I think is $15. I could be wrong, but last time I flew, I think it was that. So there's some like common cheap ones that you can do, uh, other ones that are more expensive. So, I mean, if you think about Southwest, it's 150 bucks to fly with your bike to and from. And in that case, you're probably going to get pretty close to evening out with bike flights or maybe even cheaper with bike flights. So that's one option you can do. You can also ship. Am I right in saying this Ivy? If you have a bike bag, you can put your label on that bike bag and have them ship that you don't have to have a bike box, right? Yeah. You can use, um, UPS has thick, sturdy hang tags that you can zip tie onto your handles or you can make a tie tag with an old like tyvek race number in a zip tie yeah, don't clever. stick your adhesive or like try to tape your number on a fabric bike bag because it, it just flies off like it doesn't stick well enough on it and then the label flies off and then your bike bag gets lost and that's what i used to do with bike flights is find the lost bikes <laughs> Good pro tip. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Probably because of how cold it gets, right? When it's in the cargo department, yeah, that, that could make sense. Well, yeah. And just like tape isn't, or adhesive isn't meant to stick on like Cordura fabric and yeah. stuff. If you're using like a soft case and it just flies right off. And baggage handlers basically playing curling with your bike bag. So yeah. sliding it all over the place. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other way you could do it is a bike bag. Nate, uh, we've gone through quite a few different bike bags here at the office, like testing different ones that we've liked. Uh, Evoc, I feel like makes the best ones that I've used. Would you agree? Uh, depends on what the purpose is. I like the, um, what's the, the helium one with the four wheels? Bikens. 
B I K N D. Yeah. So for road bikes, I like the bike end one because I can set two sets of, uh, fit two sets of wheels in there and it has four wheels on it. And it's so easy to carry, even if it's heavy, <clears throat> the Evoc pro bag or the, the, no, sorry, the Evoc XL bag. That one is really good for mountain biking. And it's, it's just a solid big bag. The thing I don't like about it is you, the wheel in the front is detachable for like mm-hmm. airline stuff. And I think twice now we've forgotten to take the wheel off. And or they then, take the bag from you before you can take it off. And yeah. I mean, you could always yeah. stop them. Be like, Hey, give me that wheel. Um, yeah. but you have to, you have to take the wheel off before you do it or else you'll lose that wheel. And then it can be so heavy to pull it through the Evoc pro bag, which is the one where you don't have to put your handlebars, take That's them off the road one. Yeah. The road yeah. or something like that. Yeah. I was so now. excited about that thing. And then one, my bike was still too big for it, but two, it is such a big bag that like you had to get like special cars and even putting it into like this, this like huge bus. The guy was like, it's not going to fit. We can't do it. Um, which is annoying for all the other travel stuff. Uh, Mm -hmm. so for me, the two, the two ones that I use, and it's a luxury to have two bike bags, but we share them. So it's good to have Mm -hmm. them is the Evoc XL for mountain biking and then the helium for road. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've used, I like the bike and jet pack as well. That's like a good one that can work for road or mountain bikes. It's not going to be like, it's a pain to carry because it doesn't have a front yeah. wheel. Um, the problem with that one is that the, the front handle, at least in the old ones was like yeah. flat and it digs into your hand and it was so painful. It so bad. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so what we did is we took a PVC pipe, we cut it and put it around there and then wrapped it with bar tape. Yeah. And that had, that made it so much better, but still, I mean, there's a lot of long walks in airports and sometimes you pack your bike bag pretty heavy and we're not known for huge upper body strength as cyclists <laughs> and to carry that thing for like 20 minutes as you pull through, is just annoying. Uh, yeah. that's, that's why I like the four wheels where you can just like one finger, push it through. The Evoc road bike bag pro is the one that looks like a hammerhead shark that you don't have to take your drop bars off. You do have to take mountain bike bars off. They definitely don't fit mountain bike bars. And a mountain bike won't fit in that bag unless you ride like a size extra small because of wheelbase. The wheelbase is designed around road bikes. Um, but that, that one, it fits my road bike wonderfully. And I love it because I have an integrated front end and, oh, that is a mess to take apart. So it works just fine, but I have to get like a pretty big car, like a midsize SUV or, or a truck or a minivan to be able to fit it in there because it is a portly bag, but it's my favorite bag in terms of ease. Um, and then for mountain biking, Evoc pro XL, I believe is the one they call for that. Amber, you've probably traveled with a bike bag a time or two. Uh, how about you? Yeah. Um, so in addition to luggage logistics, there's a lot of other logistics involved. And so I'm going to talk about two of my favorite things, cognitive load and snacks. So (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Um, one thing to remember is you're not going to the moon. So there's going to be grocery stores and resources where you're going. Uh, it's hard to remember that when you're packing, cause you feel like you have to have all of the things, but do some research, figure out where you are, um, where the venue is going to be, look for food chains that you like, um, grocery store chains that you like. So you can plan ahead and know what things you might be able to pick up when you get there versus having to take with you on the plane. And then plan ahead as much as you can so that you reduce cognitive load when you get there. So you can do things ahead of time, like create lists, like what's your packing list of things that you want to bring to the race each day. Um, what's the driving time from your accommodation to the race venue. What time would you need to leave each day? You can actually create all of those alarms on your phone before you ever leave on the trip and just don't turn them on until you're there. Um, Uh, You can make grocery lists for yourself and make sure that you know exactly how to get to the grocery store from your accommodation. Uh, You can have to-do lists so that you remember when and where to pick up registration and packet pickup. And you can have all of those addresses plugged in and saved into your phone if that's what you use for navigation. You can preview courses using Google Earth. There are so many cool uh, digital tools that we could use to prepare and make this really easy so that when you get on the ground, everything has already been planned out. And then that way it reduces cognitive load and it, it reduces the likelihood that you're going to have any last minute things. Mm-hmm. When it comes to, um, equipment, you can find out if there's neutral support at the event. And if there is introduce yourself as soon as possible. <laughs> and if you think that you might need their help, 
go to them as soon as possible to give them as much time as possible to help accommodate you. They will definitely want to help you, but they will also have folks who have very, very urgent needs that they're going to have to triage. So the more time you can give them to address anything that you want them to look at, the better, um, bring them gifts, express gratitude. They're wonderful people. Uh, they do great work and they're happy to help. If there is no neutral support at the event, you can reach out to local bike shops where you're going to be, uh, again, call ahead, let them know that you're coming, let them know if you know that you're going to need something, let them know what that is. Um, if you're not sure if you're going to need something, it can't hurt to call and introduce yourself and say, Hey, if anything last minute comes up, is it okay? If I pop in, it just puts you on their radar and it helps them plan ahead, which is really, really helpful. Um, and I just plan for the food, like figure out where those grocery stores are. You do not want to be running around the night before the race, trying to figure out where you're going to get your breakfast in the morning. You do not want to be running around after the race, wondering where you're going to get your next meal from. Mm -hmm. uh, so locate good grocery stores, uh, figure out if, if you have special dietary needs, figure out where you can get what you need for that. Uh, make sure that you know what you'll have available at your accommodation. If you're going to have a microwave or a fridge or a full kitchen available to you, you can plan around that as well. Uh, but make sure that you have all that planned ahead of time so that when you get there, you really don't have to worry as much about the logistics and you can focus as much as possible on the race. Great points. Uh, some things I carry with me in my bag, other than the bike. Uh, so I try to carry all my person or in my carry on my helmet, shoes, and some kit, just because then if my bike is lost, maybe I can borrow a bike from somebody, uh, or, you know, borrow one from a shop, something like that. Are somebody likes to wear that the hard way? Uh, also? no, I've never. So knocking on probably not real wood, but I've never had a bike back bike lost. I've never had a bike broken. I've never had any issues like that. And I'm flying next week to 24 hours in the old Pueblo. So let's hope that I don't jinx anything, but if jinxes are real, we'd make them happen. I'm reminding myself they're not real. Okay. So, uh, but the things that I carry with me, I do that. So then, but if you're a person like Nate, you probably who cares? Because it's going to be hard to find an XL or double, you know, double XL, or if you ride an extra small bike or something like that, it might be hard, but I try to carry kit, shoes, helmet, that sort of stuff with me in the bike bag. I bring, there's this uh, feedback sports makes this little torque wrench. That's super compact. And there's a lot of different brands that make them, but a compact little torque wrench is a great idea because you'll probably be putting on handlebars or you'll be putting on your stem and torque values are super important for those two things. So bring that. Don't bring CO2s. In some cases, they can actually like flag your bag and make it so that you're, they won't load your bag onto the plane uh, because CO2s are not allowed. So do not fly with CO2s. Make sure you take those out. Uh, I do put my nutrition, my ride nutrition in there. Uh, unless I know, for example, like, oh, well, I can actually go to this store and buy that nutrition somewhere else, then that's easy. Um, but if you have like custom nutrition or anything else, fly with that. Um, and then I always bring a towel like a, a, like a rag that I can get dirty. Uh, that way I can, if I don't have time to thoroughly clean my bike or something else beforehand, I can do that. Always fly with your bike being clean. That is a really important mm -hmm. detail because if you have a bunch of gunk in there, then you show up at the race and your drivetrain's all dirty and you won't have time to wash it. That'll be a pain. And same thing with going back, clean your bike beforehand, especially if you've been riding in an area around the ocean where it's really salty because who knows how long you're going to leave that bike in the bike bag afterward. Like I'm looking at you, Kona athletes, you probably don't want to get on that bike at all for a couple of months and you might leave it in the bike bag and then it's just corroding full of rust. So wash your bike before. And, after. I, and mechanics will thank you. So if you're going to have anybody work on your bike at the race or when you get home, they really appreciate having a clean bike. It goes a long way. Yep. And uh, really small things though, but try to find small tools like a, a Y key as they call it, you know, with the different hex bits is great to bring instead of a set of Allens, um, for pedals, uh, make sure that you can take your pedals on and off easily. Uh, there's some stuff that you can put grease on your pedals and that's fantastic way to stop them from seizing on. Um, but I've seen plenty of situations where people fly to a race and they have their pedals in their cranks and they're impossible to get out or they're, they're really tricky to get in because they don't have the right tools. So but I have a really small toolkit that I bring. It fits in a, in a saddle bag. And then I have that little torque wrench. And those are basically the things that I bring. Don't forget your bottles too. I've done that plenty of times where I pack everything, but I forget to bring bottles. And then I run some random bike shops, bottles or something that I've found. And they're usually not very good. So um, Nate, one, one last quick tip, and then we can end the podcast. Yep. Learn this from DC Rainmaker, but put air tags if you have iOS in your stuff. Ooh, yep. When you, Ooh. I had blood, luggage lost and United didn't know where it was. And I'm like, 
it's sitting there. I can see it on my, uh, on my app. And I've even used it when you don't know where oversized luggage comes out. And I, I did it. I did that for uh, Cape for Cape Epic. And Sophia and I had to walk to a very different spot. I think it was even a different terminal for some reason. It was crazy. But the huh. air tags let us know where it was at and just went to it. That's a great tip. I like that. Cool. Uh, I think that covers it. Oh, what a what a podcast. We covered tons of information. Uh, if you want to uh, go and check out AIFTP detection, let's be real, who doesn't want to not test anymore? Uh, if you want to do that, go to trainerroad.com, give it a shot, uh, check it out. It's going to be super exciting. All this stuff we, we promised after adaptive training came out that we would be adding on more and more. And this is it. Like we are adding more all the time and we, are, we have so much more that we want to add. It's super exciting. So Go sign up for Trainer Road, get faster, accomplish whatever goals you have. And if you're watching on YouTube, give this a thumbs up. You can subscribe on YouTube, which you totally should. And you should join us for our live streams Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific. And you can hit a notification bell so then you know whenever we go live or post a video, which is basically daily. So with all that said, thanks everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.